record me in the club. Okay, record. Uh, we are live, we are recording now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Giulio Brisco. I'm going to be your host uh, today uh, for the TerraSAM Space Day Colloquium. This event is always held on uh, July 20. This is what was happening on July 20, 52 years ago. Uh, we all have the impression that not much has happened in space flight since that moment. But you know, uh, under the ashes, the fire kept burning and we're seeing uh, many new things happening in space right now. I had this picture of uh, Sir Richard uh, Branson in his first suborbital flight of Virgin, Virgin Galactic just a few days ago. Of course, now we should also have a picture of uh, Jeff Bezos, who uh, had its first uh, Blue Origin suborbital flight that ended uh, half an hour ago. It was interesting. In this uh, flight, uh, there were the oldest, the youngest, and uh, the richest astronauts so far. So many interesting things happening. Let's not forget Elon Musk. Another very interesting thing is that now there is a Chinese flag on the moon. Um, I think we will hear more about that in the first talk. By the way, let me just tell you that uh, I have written this very short book about uh, most of the things that we're going to discuss today. Mm. For example, the concept that, uh, you know, going to space, protecting the environment of the Earth, building uh, a nicer society, are not mutually ex exclusive goals, but uh, are things that in some sense share the same uh, cultural DNA and uh, can uh, go together. As a matter of fact, uh, they uh, need to go together. And I happen, I hope that uh, it will be so. This is a very important point. I think we will hear much about that in the second and in the last two talks. We had these uh, great expectations for uh, unlimited human futures in the black sky among the stars. This has uh, important philosophical and uh, spiritual implications. And uh, okay, now let me just admit Martin who is coming in. And this uh, is uh, my interpretation of uh, TerraSAM, the organization that is uh, hosting and sponsoring this event. After this uh, short introduction, I'll just give the floor to the first speaker who is uh, Dr. Namrata Goswami, the author of a very interesting book on uh, geopolitics uh, uh, factors and aspects of uh, space flight called uh, Scramble for the Skies. Namrata, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giulio. And it's a great pleasure to be here at the Terrasome Space Day. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. So uh, in the uh, 45 minutes that I have been given in terms of making my presentation, 
uh, what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about space exploration and development and what the future holds for us. And as Julia was mentioning, the book that actually uh, me and my co-author Peter Gerritsen published last year in October called Scramble for the Skies, the Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space, uh, looks into the future in terms of uh, from 2019, uh, where we started writing those futures to about 2060. And I'll talk a bit about that in the scenario slides that I have for you. Now, one of the interesting concepts that we uh, dealt in the book, as well as in my own research for the last 20 years, is that I study great power politics, but I also study the implications of space for not just great powers, but also medium powers, for example, UAE or Luxembourg. And so one of the interesting concepts that has been around since 1967 with the signing of the Outer Space Treaty is the concept of international space collaboration. And so the Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty, as, I, as you can see here in the slide, talks about the exploration of, and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial body, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development, and shall be the province of all mankind. And so it's interesting that at that time when the Cold War was actually the context in which this particular treaty was uh, signed and conceptualized, uh, the treaty countries still talked about the importance of collaboration and also the importance of freedom of scientific investigation of space. Now, the second treaty that actually elaborates on the Outer Space Treaty, but hasn't been signed by the 110 countries that signed on to the Outer Space Treaty is, of course, the Moon Agreement. And so Article 11 of the Moon Agreement, which has been signed by about 18 countries, but not ratified by India, for example, who is a signatory, is that the orderly and safe development of natural resources from outer space the rational management of those resources, the expansion of opportunities in the use of those resources, and the equitable sharing by all states and the benefits derived from them. So unlike the Outer Space Treaty that did not really talk about the concept of resources from space, but limited itself more to the uh, critical dimension of restricting weapons of mass destruction like nuclear weapons in space, the Moon Agreement actually did talk about the importance of natural resources. The only reason I think why the Moon Agreement does not seem to have the kind of uh, attractiveness, for example, like the Outer Space Treaty is because it does not allow private sector to play a role in space. And so, for example, it would not recognize the rights of the new space companies that we have today, even if they have missions for resource extraction. So it's mostly limited to state funded space programs. Now, recently, as Julia was mentioning, since 1967, then the moon landing in 1969, is that there has been recent developments. For example, you have the US Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act 2015, which is signed by President Obama into law is a very critical, important development in terms of space development, including the important rights of private sector. So the Commercial Law Space Launch Competitive Act actually allows American citizens to extract the resources that they actually use their money, technology, and expertise to get, for example, on the lunar surface, and so you can profit from it without actually uh, enabling any kind of national sovereign appropriation because that's not allowed under the Outer Space Treaty. So you do have legislation in the US today. Uh, in April 2019, Greece submitted a proposal to the United Nations uh, Peaceful Use of Outer Space uh, uh, Unit, where it talked about the importance of establishing a mandate to develop and propose alternative legal solutions capable of providing the legal certainty necessary for acts of exploration, exploitation, and the utilization of outer space resources. So before I get into my presentation more, one of the important uh, insights that Peter and I discovered in our research for the last five years for the book, so we started the book project around 2016, and finally got it published in 2020 October, is that the context of space has changed today. 
So space is no more about just prestige, reputation, and state-funded astronauts making it to space where people, ordinary people, cannot ever dream of getting to space without being picked up by the state-funded uh, space organizations, for example, NASA or the China National Space Administration. Today, as you see from the flight that Jeff Bezos just executed, that if you have the ability to buy a ticket, and I'm sure the price of those will come down, like the price of airplane tickets, ordinary people can actually dream of getting to space and being able to see space. So it's actually an opening up of the space frontier, which has implications, as Julio mentioned, from the spiritual and the philosophical perspective of do we keep it limited to just elite state funded astronauts or do we actually enable a child, for example, in a remote area in Burma or in Northeast India, where I actually originate from, to dream about getting to space through the means that they can actually develop. So it's a very fundamental shift. Now, there are certain national legislations that are ongoing. I already mentioned the US Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act, but you also have a country like United Arab Emirates that is talking about establishing its own national legislation in enabling concepts like space-based solar power and space mining. So it's not just the US that's talking about the importance of space resources. You have China. Uh, in my visit to China in 2017 for uh, collecting data for my book, China's uh, most uh, eloquent space lawyer, Liu Shopping, uh, in an interview with me mentioned that China is also working on a national space law. And recently in uh, around July, 2020, the director general of the China National Space Administration pointed out that they will be actually establishing a national space law by uh, this year. India is also starting to converse about the importance of space resources. And then you have Japan. Uh, Japan is talking about establishing a lunar uh, base in collaboration with its private space company, iSpace, by 2040. And Luxembourg in Europe is actually one of the most advanced countries in terms of establishing national space legislation to support uh, space resource mining and extraction. Uh, and actually has established a legislation in 2016, just after the US Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act. Now, President Trump, when he was, uh, just before he uh, you know, uh, talked about the importance of space and the critical importance of having a US Space Force, actually uh, put out an executive order. And this is where geopolitics comes in, as Julio was mentioning. So in that particular executive order, which has not been uh, appended by the Biden administration, so it still holds, is that the Moon Agreement, the United States is not a party to the Moon Agreement. Further, the United States does not consider the Moon Agreement to be an effective or necessary instrument to guide nation states regarding the promotion of commercial participation in the long-term exploration, scientific discovery, and use of the Moon. So in international law, if you have a treaty agreement where a country has not registered its opposition, it becomes customary international law. So in that context, it is very critical for a country to actually register an opposition so that that particular treaty is not binding, for example, on its private space sector. Now, we have the Artemis Accord, which was uh, inaugurated by the former Trump administration and has been continued by the Biden administration, which is the Artemis Accord for lunar development. And what is interesting is that the Artemis Accord talks about establishing uh, bilateral relationships between NASA and other uh, international space agencies in terms of collaborating for developing lunar resources. And it talks about utilization of lunar resources in obligation with the Outer Space Treaty. You also have bodies like the Hague International Space Resources Working Group that is talking about establishing a regulatory framework for the extraction of space resources. Now, some of the international space collaborations that are critical to keep in mind before I get into specifics about particular countries is that you have a collaboration between the European Space Agency and NASA, of course, on lunar development. You have a recent collaboration between the Japanese Space Agency and, the, and NASA for the lunar uh, development uh, possibility, but you also have alternate alignments. So you have China and Russia that signed a memorandum of understanding this year to develop an alternative alignment for the development of lunar resources. And by 2036, both countries hope 
to establish a lunar research station, and they've already put out their map, as you'll see from my slides later. So there are, of course, the important critical difference today as between the Cold War is that now we have the entry of new space actors. And of course, we talk about the space actors in the US, for example, SpaceX and Blue Origin and Made in Space and so forth. But you also have new space agencies in other countries. For example, if you see this particular photograph, this is the first experiment of a reusable capability for China. So China's Link Space actually showcased the launch of their reusable rocket to about 300 meters and, and landed it back. Uh, just recently, China launched a reusable space plane that actually landed back. So China is also starting to develop reusable capability. And then you have India, Bellatrix Aerospace, that is developing propulsion technology, which is run by a 24-year-old who I interviewed when I did my field visit in India, that actually is starting to recognize the importance of the development of uh, nuclear or thermal propulsion beyond just chemical propulsion. So you can see that there is the development of the new space sector across the world, which is a difference from the Cold War. Now, who owns space? Now, this is something that has been in the conversation for a very long time, but it's critical for our discourse today. So when we talk about going to space or in terms of the asteroid mining or lunar resources, the biggest question that exists is who owns that? So according to the Outer Space Treaty, space is the domain of or the province of mankind. So if it's the province of mankind, if you extract resource, for example, on an asteroid, who does that resource belong to? Does it belong to the company that extracted it? Or does it actually belong to the world because it's a real estate that belongs to the world? So how will you actually distribute profitable resources, for example, like platinum? Uh, to, my, to the interesting uh, uh, development that is happening today, space law is one of the most important developments because it's trying to resolve those issues, but it's not been resolved yet. And that is why the space programs of countries like China become so important to be understood. And so, as I mentioned, space law is trying to develop concepts as to how will you actually, uh, you know, uh, share resources like water or platinum that could be found on asteroids or the lunar surface. Now, coming specific based on that change that I have mentioned in terms of how is space conceptualized and the difference between space and the Cold War, which was about prestige and very short-term human presence to thinking about long-term presence. One country that is actually developing very exciting uh, space goals is China. I study China, I've been studying China for the last 20 years, especially their grand strategy. And so these are some of the goals that China has identified between 2002 and 2049. So one is space-based solar power. They already have the first state-funded program for space-based solar power since 2019. Lunar and asteroid mining, establishing permanent presence for access to space and deep space probe. Now, critically for China, space is seen as a part of their civil military fusion strategy. And that is where the concept of Chinese space power becomes critical. So according to China, to develop capability without actually uh, breaking down into war is a very important part of their grand strategy. It draws from the ancient Chinese thinker, Shangju. And so what their argument is that space is not just civilian, but space also has very important military implications. And you can see this in terms of the conversations coming out from safe space advocates. So one of the critiques of space advocacy is that it does not really consider the military dimensions of space. So it's very interesting to see that in the Chinese space program and also the US and Indian and Japanese space program today, the military development of space is becoming also an important part of their investments in space and resources that they bring to bear. Now, President Xi Jinping put out a very important speech when he talked to the astronauts of the Sunzhou 10 mission and the Chang'er 4 mission, that was China's first mission to the lunar far side, humanity's first mission. So President Xi mentioned that experience tells us that great undertakings begin with dreams and dreams are the source of vitality. China as a nation pursues that dream bravely and the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee's decision to implement the lunar exploration project 
is to pursue the nation's unyielding dream of flying into the sky and for the national rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So unlike the US where there is a plethora of actors and two different parties or India where it's a democracy and you have a multiplicity of actors, in China, the main party that is behind China's space ambition is of course the Communist Party of China with about 91 million members. And so some of China's future timeline for space-based solar power, which has been advocated by Wang Shiji, the father of China's long march rockets that launched China into space. In 2010, they talked about the concept design in 2019 to establish a space-based solar power plant, which they have already accomplished. By 2020, they want to demonstrate how space-based solar power can actually be uh, tested for in-orbit construction, which they are already doing in Shangqing last year. And by 2025, complete the first 100 kilowatt space uh, solar power demonstration in low earth orbit. And then by 2050, the first commercial level space-based solar power system will be in operation in geosynchronous orbit. Now, China's Mars mission has of course caught the attention of the world with the first landing this year from an Asian country. India was the first country to send an orbiter to Mars in 2014. And yet China's the first country to actually send out a rover as well. And these are some of the pictures that has been sent back by that particular Zhurong rover. Now, there are some of the civilian capacities that we need to keep in mind when we talk about China's space uh, development. One, of course, is their Long March 5 rocket, which has a payload capacity of 25 tons to low Earth orbit. They are starting to very seriously invest in reusability. And this year, iSpace, which is their private space company and not the Japanese one, which is a similar name, they are planning to launch the Hyperbola 2, which is a 1.9 nine ton capable to LEO. It's a very small demonstration, but the idea is to demonstrate reusability. By 2030, China hopes to establish the Long March 9, which is going to be their heavy lift rocket, about uh, lifting 140 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Now, what is interesting is that some of the goals for 2030 are actually synchronous with the development of their heavy lift because by 2030, they want to accomplish a sample return from Mars, and then they want to launch humans to Mars by 2033. So it's in keeping with those goals that they are developing their Long March 9 capacity. Now, they also have military space capacity, as I mentioned. Uh, in 2007, as we all know, China actually tested their anti-satellite weapon that took out one of their own weather satellites, which made uh, American military space presence vulnerable. They also demonstrated a robotic arm on their SY-7 satellite and their SY-17 satellite that could be used not just for debris removal, but also to grab another country's satellite in case there is conflict. And in 2015, China was the first country to establish a separate military space service, the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force, which was consequently followed by the establishment of the US Space Force as well in 2019. Now, one of the interesting developments for China, very similar to Starlink that SpaceX is trying to develop is the National Satellite Mega Constellation, which is about 12,992 satellites to be launched as per filings with the International Telecommunication Union. So the idea is to be able to have a very similar satellite internet that SpaceX is trying to develop. And what is different, however, in the Chinese conceptualization of space vis-a-vis -vis the US conceptualization of space is that for China, space is part of their critical infrastructure. So they have recognized the importance of space in terms of economic development, which is number one. Uh, GPS, for example, when we use our phones, we use GPS for from getting from one point to the other. And they have recognized this as a critical infrastructure, e-commerce, ATM transactions, e-medicine, and so many other facilities that space enables. And so last year, the National Development and Reform Commission, which is one of China's most important body, designated space as critical infrastructure, which means priority investment. Now, they also have the Belt and Road Initiative in space, which is a diplomatic initiative. So under the Belt and Road Initiative, which is about 140 countries as members, China wants to establish uh, space collaboration and cooperation with countries and offer their space uh, facilities and launch capacity to countries on a very subsidized price. So it's a very interesting concept that President Xi Jinping actually started. 
China also has a very advanced commercial space sector, as I mentioned. Uh, some of the companies to keep in mind are LinkSpace, XSpace, Tencent, OneSpace, LandSpace, and iSpace. Let's get to Russia. So Russia has been a country which historically is the first nation as the Soviet Union to launch to space. 1957, the first man-made satellite or human-made satellite made it to space. The first man to go to space, of course, again was Russian. And so today, Russia's space program cannot be written off. So recently, uh, President Vladimir Putin gave a speech on what space power constitutes. He identified it as a strategic industry directly relate, related to national defense. This was given on the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight. And also there were recognition that space plays very critical role in military development, for example, ASAT weapons, uh, ground-based uh, laser capability, uh, rendezvous at proximity operation. And Russia actually very similar to China is developing one of the far, uh, cited and very important, I would say uh, future cited, uh, forgive me, in terms of developing a nuclear propelled spacecraft, which is called the transport and energy module. And then as you know, Russia has announced a lunar program as well. Their goal is to establish an integrated man moon operation system by 2040. And Russia is against the Artemis Accord. So Russian spokesperson, uh, the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov very clearly stated that the Artemis Accord is unacceptable because it means that US is trying to privatize space. So Russia and China are actually against the privatization of space because I think they realize that the US today has an edge in terms of space flight because of the private sector, especially companies like Blue Origin, the first to make it to suborbital space, and SpaceX, the first to make it to orbital space with reusable capability, which means the cost of launch is coming down. Now, India, the country that I originate from, also has a very uh, mature space capacity. India actually held the record of launching about 104 satellites on a single rocket in 2017, which was of course uh, broken by SpaceX last year. Uh, what is critical is that uh, uh, this year, actually, in January, we, when SpaceX launched 143 satellites, India has indigenous launch capacity, including the polar satellite launch vehicle and the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle. India has a lunar mission. In fact, India's uh, Chandrayaan-1 mission was the first mission to discover water ice on the lunar surface based on a NASA mineralogy mapper experiment. India wants to invest in reusable capability and also invest in human missions. India's budget for space is about 1.8 billion. Now, some of the future ambitions of India, as I mentioned, is advanced propulsion, heavy lift launch vehicle, semi-cryogenic stage vehicle, and also a space station by 2030. So as you know, China is constructing a space station as we speak, the Tianhe, which is already up in space, and then the Tiangong, which is going to be completed next year. And this is happening in the context where the International Space Station might not be funded beyond 2028. And so uh, Chinese space station might be the only space station that is there for astronauts to go to. India is also hoping to establish a space station by 2030. Now, I mentioned this already. And so why are we really talking about space, especially from the concept or the conceptualization of countries like China that recognizes the critical importance of the Earth Moon system and is the only country that actually has a relay satellite the Magpie Bridge satellite in L2, which is today functioning and helping their far side mission to relay back to Earth. So one of the reasons why we are talking about it is because there is a recognition that the moon is a very critical part of space resources development. The uh, points that are important for such capacity are of course Lagrange 2, but there is also recognition of L4 and L5. And then the other critical reason why the moon is starting to become so critical from space development is because of this. The moon has solar energy that can be used for development. The moon has oxygen, the moon has water. The moon is also uh, seen to have helium-3 that can be used for nuclear fusion. And so these are some of the concepts that are becoming very critical in the space discourse today. 
Now, the other reason why a country like China is talking so seriously about developing a base on the moon is because of the understanding that the gravity well of the moon is much lower than the gravity well of Earth. So to launch from Earth, a rocket takes about 22 times more energy than say if you have a base on the moon and you use lunar resources for construction, you actually take 22 times less energy. And this is a concept that has been recognized by Wang Shishi and as well as uh, Li Peiyang, who is the head of China's lunar mission. Now, some of the key players, as I mentioned before, but I want to reiterate to the audience is the US in terms of lunar development, China, Russia, India, and Japan. Now, China's focus on the moon is a very different focus. It's not about sending humans to the moon, unlike, say, the Artemis program that wants to send the first woman and the next man. These are very symbolic missions, but do they actually develop long-term capacity for human settlement? In China's argument, the more important development is to, be, is to recognize the moon as an Earth-Moon economic zone by 2050, where Bao Weiming, who is the, one of the main architects of this conversation, points out that if we are successful in extracting resources, it could be worth $10 trillion annually by 2050, and he breaks it down. Now, as Julia was mentioning, China became the first country to land uh, a fabric flag on the moon in this century. Of course, we had the US doing it in the last century. And so China's argument is that the 21st century is the century of Chang'e, which is the Chinese lunar mission. And the first fabric flag uh, as pointed out by the Global Time, which is a state funded news media outlet is the Chinese flag. And so they're very critical in terms of how they view the moon. Now, some of China's lunar exploration program, given the fact that I'm talking about the moon, all the ones in blue have all been accomplished. And what is so interesting from my uh, research is that these programs were in development since 2002. And what is very interesting from the Chinese lunar program is that the deadlines that they set 15 years ago, they meet on time. So all the deadlines you see, 2013, 2019, 2020, were decided 15 years ago. And they actually met those deadlines on time. The last mission was the Lunar Sample Return Mission. And then the missions that are going to come in 2024 is the Chang'e 6, aim at bringing samples from the South Pole. And then by 2036, they want to establish the first research base on the moon in collaboration with Russia. One of the interesting insights of China's strategic thinking on space is the concept of territoriality, which we actually deal a lot in the book. This is because if you listen to the conversations that Ye Peiying, for example, the head of China's lunar mission pointed out, he says that the universe is an ocean. The moon is the Dayu Island, which is the uh, East China Sea Islands, which is disputed with Japan. Mars is the Huamang Island, which is the South China Sea Island. And this is the most important thing. He points out that if we do not go there first, we will be blamed by our descendants. So we need to claim territory in this outer space resources. And he's the head of China's lunar mission. These views were supported by the, the chief designer of the lunar mission, Wang Jiang, who pointed out that the reason why China is going to the moon is not for prestige mission. It's not to land the next Chinese taikonaut, their astronaut on the moon. It's about being able to tap the rich resources on the lunar surface, and which is a tremendous supplier of energy for human beings. So the conceptualization of the moon is very different. And what is interesting is that the Outer Space Treaty does not deny the utilization of space resources from a very peaceful perspective. And so you can always argue that because the word utilization is there, it means you can utilize resources on the lunar surface and beyond. And the Moon Agreement, as I mentioned before, is not signed by China. So China is not a obliga uh, treaty obligatory to the Moon Agreement. Now, I already mentioned this in terms of uh, lunar geopolitics. Now, in the last few minutes that I have before I open it up for discussion, one of the interesting development in the uh, lunar perspective is also the importance of the Google Lunar X Prize. So the Google Lunar X Prize actually uh, advocated, and what we are seeing today is a result of that, that we have uh, companies like iSpace, Team Indus, which is an Indian company, Space IL, an Israeli company that is planning to land the first commercial lander on the moon, nearly succeeded in 2019. And then you have uh, Synergy Moon that is hoping to collaborate in establishing uh, development of moon by 2022. 
Now, in this particular slide, it'll astound you that it's not just China or the US that is talking about the moon. You also have players across the aisle. So you have uh, the private sector that is hoping to establish lunar presence. You have China, you have uh, the US, you have Japan. And then if I click on the other slide, you'll see that in the next year, these are the uh, lunar landers that are in the planning. Now, I do know that Mastan space has uh, moved the date to 2023, but you actually have India's Chandrayaan tree, which is uh, being launched in 2022. You have JAXA's smart lander for investigating the moon. You have uh, Intuitive Machines, which is a private company that hopes to send the Nova C2 to the moon. And then it's not just these countries, you have South Korea that is planning to launch the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter by 2022. And then you also have iSpace, Hakuta, our mission that is going to the moon by 2022. And then by 2023, you have all these missions. You have Hakuta, our second mission, which will include a lunar lander and rover. You also have the Dear Moon Project, which we all know, which is a lunar tourism mission and art project, the spiritual dimension of space coming in. And then you have the Artemis uh, you know, investments that are going to happen. Now, 2024, you also have Blue Moon by Blue Origin, which is a robotic space cargo career. But then you have Russia coming in. So Roscosmos Lunar 26 is a lunar polar orbiter, which is part of the Luna Globe program that is going to be launched in 2024. And guess what? In 2024, you'll have UAE that will launch the Rashid, the UAE's first lunar rover in collaboration with iSpace to study the lunar surface. So you can see from the slides that the development of the moon and the resources of the moon are not just a focus of US private company or the US state side or China, but actually a global enterprise in the making. So we have a very changed world in terms of how we are viewing space. Now, between 2025 and 2027, you also have Luna 28, which is a Russian lunar lander mission. But you also have a very interesting collaboration, which is the Luna 27 between Russia and the European Space Agency, which will be going to the South Pole Aitken Basin. Now, uh, between 2028 and 2030, one of the missions to watch is the Chang'e 7 which is the orbiter, rover, lander, and hopper to make a detailed survey of the south pole of the moon, which is in continuation of their lunar base. And so this is a press release, which I urge all of you to go through. This is uh, basically put out in June by the China National Space Administration, where they actually tell you the different phases of their research station, which will start construction in 2031. And now, as I mentioned before, once they put out deadlines in the public media, it has legitimacy. And the fact that they'll try to meet these deadlines has been proven by earlier record of Chinese space programs. And so the Earth Moon future, as I see it, will be about helium-3 extraction. It'll be about lunar mining with artificial intelligence, very autonomous. And it'll also be about moon ports, as I see from the different countries that I have mentioned. Now, one of the other technologies which I think I should talk about is space-based solar power. So the, uh, this is the design of the China National Space Administration that you see, which won the competition for the best design in the world in the International Astronautical Congress. And so, as I mentioned before, they want to establish a solar satellite uh, in geosynchronous orbit by 2050. Now, you also have a US Air Force Research Laboratory experiment uh, partnering with Northrop uh, Grumman uh, on space-based solar power. But then one of my colleagues uh, also has a test which is happening in space through the US X-37 plane from the Naval Research Laboratory looking on power beaming, which is one of the most important technologies for space-based solar power. Now, the moon is not the only system that countries are looking at or private sector is looking at. The other important planet which is under development is of course Mars and the asteroid belt. Now if you see this particular graphic you can see that the asteroid belt is enormous and as mentioned by uh, thinkers like John Lewis 
asteroids themselves have a lot of resources that can be brought to bear. And so countries like China, US, India, Japan, UAE are also looking at developing capacity to go to Mars. And Mars is important because <laughs> Mars could have water. So there is the argument that Mars had water once and there is water under the surface. Mars can also have a lot of minerals that could be brought to bear. Now, one of the asteroids that has caught the imagination of the world is, of course, Psyche 16. So Psyche 16 is a giant metal asteroid, uh, which actually has a potential of 10,000 quadrillion worth of gold. And these are the kind of concepts and uh, scientifically based analysis that is actually leading countries to invest in concepts like asteroid mining. Now, the other reason why Mars is uh, interesting is because Mars is not very dissimilar from Earth. Mars has an atmosphere. But one thing which is important to note is that Mars gravity well is, of course, much higher than the moon because the moon does not have an atmosphere. And so some of the Mars program that we keep, need to keep in mind when we're thinking about space is of course the Mars Exploration Program, which is led by NASA. You also have SpaceX, which wants to have a Mars program to facilitate the eventual colonization of Mars. They use that particular word or the settlement or the development of Mars. You also have the UAE Mars Program, which is hoping to enhance the capacity to study Mars atmosphere. And then you have the Chinese Mars Program, which is going to be a program that hopes to land uh, humans in Mars by 2033. You also have India, with the Mangalyam program for developing capacity for Mars, and then Mars sample return between European Space Agency and NASA. And so asteroid programs, some of the programs that we need to keep in mind for asteroids is of course, Russia and China have just signed an agreement talking about asteroid sample return. But one of the concepts which, are, which is becoming critical is asteroid defense. So in case we face the prospects of the dinosaurs, that were killed by an asteroid impact. So it's a very serious discussion in the space community today that is there a possibility to develop a capacity to deflect an asteroid uh, if it's about to hit Mars. NASA's Lucy mission will complete a 12 year journey to eight different asteroids and will actually study such particular prospects. And so we are actually uh, in a very interesting world where the concepts of space the concepts of space development, the concepts of long, uh, you know, uh, long-term ability to become uh, spacefaring is changing. And one of the reasons why today's space uh, development is so different is this particular chart. So if you look at this chart, look at the amount of space vehicles that are in development. Um, yes, Julio, I saw that. Does it mean I have five minutes? Okay, great. So uh, if you look at this particular chart, uh, you can see that there is the development of capacity from France. Uh, you have China's Long March 5, which is already a, a, a vehicle that is being used. You also have New Glenn, which is going to be developed, and the Falcon Heavy, which is, of course, one of the most important space launch vehicle. But if you look at the next slide, it'll tell you that one of the reasons why there is excitement among humanity for space is because, especially from Earth, as long as we do not have the basis on the moon that we are talking about in the next 20 years, one way that you can bring down the cost of launch is of course reusability, but also because you are going to develop very important rockets. For example, like the 921 from China and the Starship, which is going to be able to lift 100 plus metric tons to low Earth orbit and is reusable. So one of the important concepts for bringing down the cost of launch per ton is that the rockets are reusable. And so you can actually be able to have a launch per ton, which is in the hundreds of dollars and not the thousands of dollars. And if that happens, say by 2035, the ability to go to space, the ability to send construction material, the ability to go beyond just low Earth orbit, the price of it comes down. And so space is going to become much more affordable. Now, in the last two minutes, this is the world we are in. So during the Cold War, we just had two important space agencies, the, the NASA and uh, the Russian Soviet Union Space Agency. We had uh, China, India establishing space agencies, but they were not as important. 
today you have space agencies all over the world. Turkey just uh, announced goals to go to the moon in collaboration, if, if I can see the future with Russia. And we know Russia is already capable of launching to space. You have the European space agencies, you have African space agency that has been established uh, as a statute of the African Union with 54 countries being part. So it's a very different world that we exist today that actually the whole world is talking about getting to space and they see space from a very economic perspective. Now, finally, this is the book that actually resulted from all that research that we did in terms of the change in space, the discourses in space, and the amount of countries that are actually investing in space today. And so some of the futures that we saw were basically this, that you could have a space future where India becomes a very important player or leads the constitution of norms. You might have a space future by 2060 where the United States continues to be the protector of the REM basically free trade uh, norms that are recognized, legal constitutions, unlike China, where uh, the, the earth-based behavior of China is that it signs on to legal agreements, for example, in the dispute in the South China Sea with countries like Indonesia, Philippines, and so forth. But when it comes to actual behavior, it says that those legal agreements do not bind it. So it can do unilateral activities. So these are the kind of futures that we talked about where there could be the potential of crisis in terms of the developments that we are seeing. And so some of the situational scenarios, as I mentioned, where claim disputes, trafficking, unsafe practices, economic punishment, privateering, deliberate harmful interference, which is something that we need to think of in terms of the futures that we are dealing with. And so the competitive vision is that the power to enable lunar mining in order to build geosatellites at scale is the Chinese vision. And so also one of the very important vision in terms of space is that we are able to use concepts like space-based solar power that can beam back energy to earth 24 hours and which is renewable, but which also enables developed world lifestyles in developing countries. So this is one of the visions of the Chinese visionary Wang Shishi. So finally, I'll end with this uh, in terms of credits and uh, thank you so much for your attention and I open it up for questions. Thank you very much. This was uh, really an interesting and inspiring talk. Now I do have some questions of course, but uh, let's see if others have questions first. Komitan and switch your microphone on. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my specialty area and an area of interest really is in human rights. So I just wanted to know whether in the space treaty uh, or any other sort of treaties that that has been discussed um, and to what extent, because um, that's an area of, of interest for me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... The fact that we humans are involved in space exploration means that human rights are a critical part. Uh, so what is important to recognize is that if you look at outer space treaty, it falls within the context of the United Nations Charter and the United Nations Preamble. So if you look at the United Nations Charter, our, the Declaration of Human Rights is a very critical component of how treaties are conceptualized and how uh, distribution is going to be based on uh, equitable distribution. And so the, the larger context in which treaties are discussed today is within the framework of the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, which includes member states from all over the world. And so human rights, of course, is a very critical part. Now, it also depends on how you define human rights. So are you looking at human rights from a plurality perspective, or are you looking at human rights from an egalitarian perspective or justice perspective? Or in space, for example, when we talk about the future of space resources, which is the context today, how is that going to be distributed with countries that might not have the capacity to go to space, right? And so these are discussions that are forming a core of uh, the discussions today. One of the concerns with China, of course, is that if you look at China's, uh, especially on the President Xi Jinping. So as a person looking at China, I make a difference between China under Deng Xiaoping, who was a premier in the 1970s, under Hu Zintao, who was the premier before President Xi and under President Xi Jinping. 
So under President Xi Jinping, the Chinese state, especially the Communist Party of China has become very authoritarian. And so we also have conditions of human rights violations in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, where the national security law can arrest anyone who talks against the Communist Party. So that is why there are concerns that if that is the uh, discourse that dominates Chinese behavior on earth, Will there be the likelihood that such similar behavior will continue in space? The jury is still out, and that is why conversations like this are very important. Thanks very much. Do we have other questions? Apparently no, so I will ask one. No? Uh, let's keep uh, everything into three or four minutes. Huh? The impression I have from uh, listening to your talk and reading your book is that, well, yes, uh, uh, things uh, happening uh, happening a lot in the private sector in the US, and we have seen a demonstration today, but in uh, terms of, uh, let's uh, say, solidity of a state's vision, it appears that uh, China has kind of an edge at this moment. And among the scenario that you analyze, uh, the one that seems by far the most uh, plausible to me is the scenario in which uh, China uh, uh, dominates uh, cis lunar and outer space by the middle of this century. Uh, well, it doesn't really bother me because, you know, um, I'm not an American. I can live with the idea of uh, what King Stanley Robinson calls a red moon. But do you think, uh, is there anything that uh, the US uh, and more generally the West uh, could uh, do to avoid uh, uh, losing its edge? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, China's focus as per its state policy is to, as I mentioned, to develop the Earth Moon system, which is cis lunar space. And so they have a long-term vision to establish that by 2036. One of the advantages that China has vis-a-vis -vis, say the US is that they have the Communist Party of China in power. And so a commitment to a goal does not go through changes in administration. Exactly. And so we can see that very clearly with the goals that were articulated under Hu Jintao or Deng Xiaoping in the 1970s continue to have support today. Now, one of the ways that the West can hope to uh, compete is to be able to establish long-term space visions very, with very clearly articulated goals of why the West is going to space, right? And to have the ability to have a continuation of those policies across administrations. So one of the reasons why the Biden administration seems to be able to do that is because it has continued with the programs that the Trump administration started, including the Artemis program, the National Space Council, which was constituted, reconstituted by Trump, and also the uh, ability to support the development of the Space Force. So that's one of the ways that you can actually have an ability to uh, be able to compete. But I am still concerned because unlike the Chinese uh, space policy and goals where they look at space from an economic and industrial perspective, where there is very one-sided focus of getting to a particular goal, in the US, I haven't seen a very clear articulation of why in the long term space is important for the US population. So it is still limited to the space advocates and uh, people on the street really don't understand why space is important so that the taxpayer money has to be funded. Because unlike China, and I'll end with that, US is a democracy and it has to explain to the electorate why that much of money is required to be spent in a space program. And I haven't seen that kind of vision coming out of either the Trump administration or the current Biden administration. Thank you very much. That was a great uh, talk and I would like to recommend everyone to read uh, Nani's book which is really excellent food for thought. Uh, now, I'm supposed to give the floor to the next speaker in the program, who would be Stephen Wolf, who hasn't joined yet. So that uh, I'm going to give the floor to Komitan, the second speaker, who is a young and uh, very ambitious uh, philosopher who is uh, kind of uh, reinventing philosophy and spirituality for uh, the space fair engage. Komita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh,
can you see my screen all right? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm excited to really give you a short, a short introduction really to astronism. Uh, my name is Kami Tan and I work really to promote this belief system, this religion, this philosophy um, about space and space exploration uh, throughout the year. And I've been doing this now for about eight years since I was about um, 15 years old. And so really how this all began for me and how I sort of see sort of space exploration uh, is through a very much a philosophical religious lens. Um, I see space as really um, a source of existential um, meaning, you know, meaning of life, life purpose. And certainly for me in particular, my life now has become astronism really and um, promoting dialogue really um, regarding space. And um, again, this began with what I, what I refer to now as, as astronality. Um, this is an emotion, essentially, any type of emotion that is derived from um, experience of, of outer space. So maybe that might be observation or actually, of course, going into space. Uh, we've heard from astronauts who've experienced um, profound emotions when they've gone into space. Um, obviously, for the most of us, it's just limited to observation of the night sky, but also rockets as well. When you see a rocket going up into the night sky. Um, I call this, all these types of emotions, whether it's wonder, fear, hope, I call all of these astronality. And that is this sort of experience, really, this emotional experience is at the basis of my entire worldview, the way I see the world. Uh, this is the way that I engage with the world, really. Um, and of course, this makes astronism based on an emotion, which is very different from other belief systems. Uh, it isn't based on one single event or one single belief, uh, but it's based on sort of the cultivation of these experiences, really, uh, which is what I try to promote. And it's what I try to um, build my, my understanding of, essentially. Um, so... The American psychologist William E. Kelly has done numerous empirical studies about night sky attachment phenomena, um, the, idea, uh, the idea that um, looking up at the night sky brings about emotions, brings about um, beliefs uh, about ourselves, sense of identity. Uh, I've certainly really intertwine my identity with space. I really identify with that. It's just part of me. Uh, we're getting down to these sort of fundamental existential levels when I'm, when I'm talking about uh, the basis of astronism here. But I suppose what you could say is, is that the, like uh, I suppose other religions are based on experiences of God uh, or the divine. Astronism is based on experience of the astronomical world and of course eventually exploration uh, of that. Um, so the existence of astronality there at the end of this slide here is um, not is not contingent on astronism but astronism certainly is contingent on the existence of astronality because what I then began to, to think about was, well, I must not be the first person who's experienced this type of attachment, this type of emotions with regards to space. And of course I wasn't. And I began to look into deep history, uh, prehistoric times, in fact. And I did this for my master's dissertation last year. And I collected together a series of archeological specimen, whether that be astromorphic rock art, fossilized, um, items that add like a cosmic theme or an astronomical theme, engravings of constellations. And what I saw was is that these, this, this is a core part of humanity, that this astronality, that this sort of, this aspect of the human uh, psyche, you could say, uh, has existed for thousands of years. And what I wanted to build that into really was the theory for an astronic religious tradition. So this is a religious tradition or a philosophical tradition 
that exists alongside the other main traditions, the Abrahamic, the Dharmic and the Tawic that you'd probably be aware of. Um, and thankfully, it, this type of idea is gaining traction. And um, of course, with my promotion of astronism as well, that belongs to this tradition, this astronic tradition, um, it, it's giving it context, it's giving it in a way legitimacy. You know, I'm not just the first person who's, who's felt these things. I'm not, I've not just pulled this out of thin air. People have had these experiences for thousands of years and it's a very core element of the human person. Uh, it's a core element of our humanity, you could say. So just to finish this part off, this first section, astronality is a series of emotions. It could be wonder or fear, whatever it may be, but it's all in relation to the astronomical world. And I'm sure we've all felt this from time to time as people certainly interested in space. So at the same time, experience of astronality is the basis of the astronist way of life. And it really influences our philosophy, our beliefs, um, and, our, on, and our identities as well. Uh, my daily life is, is really integrated with space, um, not just because I talk about it all the time, but viewing space, actually going out into the back garden and actually viewing space is um, an important part of my day. Uh, other people might find that strange, but for me, that's completely normal and I need that in a way. It's that time for me to relax, that time for me to really ponder and think and reflect. Um, so, as I just mentioned, the existence of astronality is core to the human psyche, and I want to really do more empirical studies on this. I want to see how, um, how broad experience of astronality is of, across humanity. Does it vary from place to place? It's likely to do so. Of course, in cities where the night sky isn't as available, isn't as visible, um, astronality may be felt less and maybe people in cities will have to focus on viewing a rocket instead or, or watching a, a documentary to, to sort of get those feelings and understandings and, and, and that sense of, of connection to the astronomical world. So I experienced these things since I was 15 years old. But really for me, the, the thing that really pushed my um, name out there was the fact that I turned this into a belief system. Um, I wrote a few books and I'm continuing to write books and do lectures like this, speak speeches like this. Um, and emerged from this has, has been astronism, which I don't know where this will go. I don't know how it's going to look when I've passed on uh, in the far future, uh, but I want to create something that people can identify with. Um, I think that's one of the main things that people like about astronism that I've had feedback from is that they identify as astronists. And it's nice to feel that connection and that sort of community really. Uh, that, that's, I'd say one of the main draws to to what I'm, what I'm doing, my sort of endeavor with this. So one of the main areas that I wanted to really talk about today of astronism, there's so many areas, by the way, uh, too much to explore in just one presentation, but the area for me to focus on today is the idea of space exploration being the destiny of humanity. Is it really the destiny? of humanity. And this is what we call predeterminationism or just predetermination. Um, of course, this is the belief and it's a belief that I hold quite dear to my heart is that, you know, it is humanity's destiny to explore the stars, to explore the astronomical world. And I believe that this is evidenced by our, our unique evolution here on the earth. You know, we are distinguished from other species by our astronality, by our experience and, and sort of looking up at the night sky. Um, and, and I really do feel that our uh, purpose as a species is, is interlinked with outer space. Not only that, but also because of the fact that, uh, of the theory of panspermia, if that is true, then that really does link us to outer space. Uh, it, it links us in the sense of that's where our origins are. That is where we come from. So exploring space in every way we can. Um, and of course, as the, as the previous speaker um, uh, detailed, you know, we are advancing in that area. But this is a really, this is a, I see this as a, 
uh, a deeply existential endeavor. Um, humanity is trying to understand where it's come from and humanity wants to understand in a way its place in this very unbelievably large universe. And so uh, the final uh, bullet point there was, was just to, to say that, you know, to expand our species as well beyond the earth and to make our species multiplanetary is also uh, an opportunity really to uh, reach our highest possible condition as a species. And that's what we'll do, I think, by going into space. So there is a multitude of reasons and, and um, justifications for the fact or the belief that, that, that it is humanity's destiny to explore space, uh, to, to become a spacefaring uh, species. And in this sense, I'm talking sort of in a past, present and future here. I, I'm talking about these things simultaneously. I've just spoken about prehistoric times, how you know our experiences of the night sky in prehistoric times uh, set off this spark within us to explore and, and understand the world above us. Um, and then of course now we are getting involved in um, sort of deeper space exploration as we're going uh, beyond the moon towards Mars. And then also we have to look at the future as well. And this is kind of what astronism is trying to um, explore is, is sort of the deep future, you could say. Um, will we come across uh, species that are uh, intelligent or less intelligent or more intelligent than us? Uh, these types of um, endeavors will certainly uh, affect our religions, our philosophies, our understandings of who we are at that really fundamental level. So to put just a, a full stop on that, I do think that yes, humanity is destined to explore the stars and that is certainly a core element of astronist belief. So really just to get at the fundamentals as well of astronism is this idea that the astronomical world is the existential source of humanity, uh, that, that really we gain our purpose, I do anyway, I gain my purpose, my sense of self, my sense of understanding about the world and why we're here from outer space. Other people get it from other sources, space is my source. And that's how I like to see this. Um, and of course, as I just mentioned, space will provide us with many opportunities, both economic, financial, as the last speaker spoke about, but also existential, uh, philosophical, more abstract um, benefits to exploring space, uh, which is what I try and focus on and, and where my specialties lie. So uh, really what we could say about this is that the sort of role of the astronomical world then as humanity's existential source brings about three proclamations really, three astronist proclamations. The firstly, this is the reason for this is, is why astronism's worldview is cosmocentric. So we see the world in a way that focuses on outer space. We are cosmocentric religion or cosmocentric philosophy as distinguished from or contrasted with theocentric, geocentric and anthropocentric understandings of the world. Secondly, of course, it is for this reason that astronism is based on this idea that humanity will be saved through outer space, that, that humanity, that outer space will be our salvation. This is where we're gonna to get to higher conditions for ourselves. If we don't do this, if we don't explore outer space um, in the right way, then we will likely just fizzle out and um, you know, not expand, not become multiplanetary. So we've got choices here and we need to decide what choices we wanna make uh, pretty soon. Um, of course, there is, um, debates surrounding how close this sort of window of opportunity, is it going to close? Will we not have uh, that opportunity in the future? Uh, these are all debates that we love to have in astronism. I love to debate this with fellow philosophers and, and people. This is what it's all about. It's about that forum, that debate. Um, and then thirdly, uh, astronism makes the, the assertion that approximating oneself to the astronomical world is the highest 
um, moral duty, you could say, but also just an existential duty. It's the highest duty of the person, of an astronist person. Um, and this is what we call stellancy. So a person's stellancy, forgive me for all the, the new terms and everything, we do have our own terminology uh, that you won't have heard of before, but stellancy is essentially a person's proximity to the astronomical world. You know, how often do you think about the astronomical world? Are you engaging with it spiritually, intellectually? Of course, physically is quite difficult. Uh, we're limited to sort of observation, of course, for most of us, uh, but things are changing in that area, of course, as well. Uh, that's what astronism is essentially trying to do. It's trying to say that, look, throughout your life, you have an opportunity here to sort of build this sort of connection to the astronomical world. And I know this might sound a little, little, little bit fussy, uh, a little bit fuzzy, sorry, and a little bit wishy-washy, but it really isn't. It, it is, um, for me, very uh, concrete. It's, it's something that is that is um, just something that I do every day, you know. Um, I love learning about space and, and all of this, going, learning about astronomy, engaging with astronomy, just going to stargazing sessions. This is all building up what we call in astronism, my our stellancy. Um, and then if we look sort of at the sort of broader understanding and how astronism sees humanity as a whole. So I've spoken about how as an individual, I sort of benefit from outer space and how I want to approximate myself to outer space and, and learn from outer space. Uh, but what about humanity as a whole? Well, we call this process or endeavor transcension. We call it transcension. And this really sort of um, encompasses uh, space exploration activities, but it sees space exploration as a process of salvation, essentially. Uh, it sees space exploration as a journey um, upwards, uh, but also to transcend as well. So of course, transcension there. Um, and of course, what the goal is here is to unite humanity with the cosmos again. I feel that a lot of people are very disconnected to outer space. They sort of don't see, as the, as the previous speaker was speaking about, um, Americans were, you know, they've sort of become disconnected to outer space, the general public. They don't see why space is important, whether that be on an economic financial level or political level, or even on an existential philosophical spiritual level. So there really is a disconnect there. And that's what astronism is trying to link back to. It's trying to sort of re-energize this link between human interest in space and really trying to show why space is important in a philosophical way, okay? So just to give you sort of a short overview of astronism uh, as we begin to come to the end of my short presentation here, um, yeah, thanks, Julio. Um, the, I, I sort of identified two problems here. There's a survivalistic problem that humanity lives in the closed system of the Earth. It remains monoplanetary, which will lead to our inevitable devolution. That's what's going to happen if we don't do space, to be honest. Um, we will just stay here. And maybe some people are happy with that. Maybe some people don't want to go out into outer space. Maybe they don't see the purpose of it. Um, but what are the future do we have if we don't go into outer space, if we stopped all of this tomorrow? So you've got to think about that. We also have an existential one, finding the origins of where we've come from, finding out who we are as a species is very much interconnected to space. So there's two problems there that need to be continuously re resolved and attempted to to be resolved and astronism is trying to do that uh, whether it will be astronism in the end that tr uh, triumphs as the main belief system that's for history to decide uh, but we're just presenting a uh, an approach here you could say to these problems my solution is that we that we need to orient ourselves on cosmocentrism. We need to see the world in a cosmocentric way, change how people think, um, and then sort of just use as much opportunity as we can to uh, get out into the astronomical world and, and enrich ourselves intellectually, spiritually, um, and sort of hopefully engage with astronism as well. 
And hopefully the outcome there for the individual is that they'll make mo the most of their existence here on the, on the planet Earth. And then hopefully for humanity as a whole, we will get into outer space and we will discover some of those those pending questions that we that we still cannot uh, fully answer. Um, hopefully that will be the collective outcome. There is a sort of uh, couple of comparisons here. I'll let you read those quickly just with Christianity and how Christianity sees humanity and how astronism sees it. Um, but really astronism just sees making up most of this opportunity. We have this opportunity to go into outer space let's do this, but let's do it in the right way. Let's go for the right reasons. Uh, let's go for a mixture of economic reasons, but also this sort of deeper existential reasons as well. I don't want it just to be sort of unbalanced. I want, the, I want there to be a balance there. And I don't see that in the discourse as much. So that's what I'm trying to uh, promote. Again, here are just some comparisons of worldviews and how astronism differs from those. Um, of course, astronism is different from Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, they are theocentric, we are cosmocentric, um, and also differs to some degree from humanism as well. So just some concluding slides here. I've got some references and resources that I've used, uh, but there's a heck of a lot more if you're interested in my master's dissertation on astronomy in the origins of religion, if you're interested in the prehistoric stuff and going back into time. Um, here are some of the specimen that you might be interested in of the astronomic tradition. So going back into prehistory, uh, there's so much more specimen than this, but I just wanted to include a few there that you might be interested in. Here are some books that I've uh, authored recently. Most recent was the one on the right, which is the Institutional Dictionary of Astronism. That is quite extensive. Uh, of course, still working on, continuously working on new books uh, all the time, trying to promote astronism and hopefully continue to develop it. My other area, if you uh, was watching earlier, uh, is human rights. Uh, that's my other area of interest and that's what I'm currently doing my PhD on, uh, specifically religious freedom and how that is restricted around the world. So if you're interested in that area of, of research, please do take a look at my PhD work. And then finally here, uh, there's just a few links to my website. You've got comitan.org, astronism.com, and then my emails are also down there as well um, for the various different things that I do. So thank you all for listening and please send me any questions about joining astronism or becoming an astronist or really any questions, to be honest, about astronism or space. <laughs> Thanks, Julio. Thank you very much. Uh, in the meantime, if you can uh, end your slideshow so we can see yes, all uh, the people here. Does anyone have uh, questions for Cometan. Mm, doesn't seem the case. Uh, so I do have a question myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, you uh, implied, especially in the last part of your talk, that uh, besides uh, uh, philosophical implications, astronism, has uh, some kind of spiritual implications that overlap with uh, religion. Yeah. Mm. Now, when it comes to promoting a religion to the majority of people, to the person in the street, I think if you want to gain uh, immediate uh, emotional uh, uh, acceptance, you need to say something about survival after death. Mm. In the last slides, you kind of implied uh, uh, something, uh, no, no, you say that explicitly, something about uh, continued spiritual existence. Mm -hmm. after the end of uh, corporeal uh, uh, life on earth and how that links with uh, astronomist uh, philosophy. 
can you just elaborate on that? Yes, of course. Um, we are quite divided as a community already on this topic area. Um, of course, you've got the naturalists on one side, and then you've got what we call the translationists. So it's a, a very long word there. Um, but they, of course, believe, and, and I sort of shift from one to the other, um, which I think is natural. I think that's normal to do, especially for someone still so young and, and new to, to this area and still learning. Um, but yes, they there is, there is a consensus, though, that death is involved with the astronomical world, that, that there is a connection between um, the afterlife and uh, the astronomical world, which is you don't see that in, in other religions in the, in the sense of maybe the concept of heaven might be related to that, but uh, typically there is no connection between astronomical world, outer space, and the involvement of that with, with sort of afterlife or death really. Uh, so there is certainly that in astronism as a fundamental principle that yes, death is somehow, and, and the afterlife is certainly somehow involved with the astronomical world, simply because we see, of course, everything through a cosmocentric lens. So uh, for us to say that there is no involvement or, uh, of the astronomical world in uh, death and the afterlife, would be to go against our whole world view. Uh, but of course, these are debates that are continuing. And, and I don't, we try to not lay down too much dogma. This is why I've just said, you know, yes, it's involved, uh, have debates about this, uh, go forth and, and, and have debates about this. So uh, my, my position, I sort of tend to go more towards the naturalist position, uh, you know, the idea that we just have this one life and uh, we need to make the most of it. Um, but again, um, I love having debates about that. Uh, and it's, it's all part of the astronist philosophy, really. It, it, it really is. And again, you can, in a way, I could, do, I could have done a different um, presentation and, and made it much more spiritual. Uh, I could have I could have included much more spiritual metaphysical language in there. Um, so I think as well, there's many different astronisms you could say as well. Um, so it is still quite fluid, you could say. It is still quite um, like a philosophy, you know, it is in that sense, it isn't like a religion where it's sort of dogma and you've got to believe this and and, and, and that it, it is more open. It is a little bit more sort of uh, fluid. Hopefully that answers your question. Maybe it didn't. <laughs> yes. Uh, my understanding is that it's still a work in progress and I yeah. most certainly hope to reading uh, your uh, future works on that, maybe next year, maybe in 30 years. Huh? Uh, Namrata, you have a question. Yes, uh, great presentation, Komitan. I really enjoyed that. Thank I you. have a question. So uh, have you looked into the Vedanta philosophy? Because if you look at the Vedanta philosophy, one of the most important focus is a cosmic consciousness. So human beings are seen as integrated with the cosmos. And it's a cycle of life and death. And it's, it's as you mentioned, if you look at the Advaita philosophy, it's about how we are all made of uh, star stuff. And also importantly, uh, human beings are uh, looked at as, because of that, being able to do uh, redemption, concepts of redemption, suffering on their own. Komitan, you have exactly one minute to answer that. Okay. Uh, yes, I have. And I, it very much relates to me. It resonates with me. Um, it, I class that as part of that astronomic tradition that I was talking about earlier, you know, this, this religious tradition that includes everything to do with outer space. Uh, so yes, definitely. And um, I think as well, there is certainly uh, those deep truths there about, yes, us connected to the cosmos in that very deep um, spiritual, metaphysical way, uh, certainly. And um, thank you as well for, for for bringing that up because it is it, it is important to, ha to have that conversation about our sort of conscious connection to the cosmos as well um but of course astronism 
sort of is it from comes from a different perspective because it is it has been created by me uh, who i'm in in england right now so it's a western sort of understanding of things uh but certainly yeah resonates with me thank you very much let's uh, move on now steve wolf is here steve uh, uh is uh, the author of uh, an excellent i would say exceptional book called the obligation about space philosophy that uh, i would recommend that everyone should read steve the floor is yours if you want to use a slideshow just share your screen otherwise uh, just uh, speak and we will be uh listening to you Great, thank you very much, Julio. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. And uh, I've got a, listening to Cosmatin, uh, you know, he is, uh, he is a very great thinker on uh, space philosophy. And I think much of what I'm gonna be talking about is, uh, uh, is in line or is, uh, there's a lot of similar themes. Uh, and I don't think that's surprising. Um, uh, and I'm uh, very sorry that I missed Namurata. Namur I'll have to look at the, um, the recording of that event, but uh, but since you brought up the Vedic or uh, the Vedanta, uh, I, I I will say for myself uh, that I've spent um, a degree of time exploring uh, the Vedic traditions, uh, Buddhism, um, and other kinds of self actualization um, uh, inquiries and uh, and activities. Uh, spent time in deep meditation and away at uh, many retreats and so forth, and I think. That, the, that kind of an activity sort of going deep within yourself is, is definitely informed uh, my, my particular thinking on, on space. Now myself, I've been, um, I've been a space advocate for, uh, since, I was, since uh, I was a teenager right? and, I, and I've been active and I've been an active space advocate uh, since my college days. So, uh, you know, this is a integral passion uh, of mine that I've carried through um, professionally, but certainly as a result of my spiritual uh, uh, explorations, it has emerged also in that context as well. And that's out of which, out of, out of that activity has emerged my thinking relating to the, my book, The Obligation uh, that Julio uh, mentioned. So, uh, so this really, so just to get started, this really is a historic day, as we know, in this and the week in space. Uh, even as we celebrate the anniversary of Apollo 11, a moon landing, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos have gone to space on their respective uh, spacecrafts. Of course, spectacularly this morning, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos did that as well. I hope you all saw that. I, their flights mark, as I believe, the beginning of a new era in human spaceflight that I sincerely hope will, uh, will culminate in the creation of large scale communities of people living and working beyond earth. In my talk today, I wanna to take you on a journey of sorts to explore why our species is so well suited and prepared to leave this planet and begin to make new homes beyond earth. I will also invite you to consider that becoming a multi-planetary species is an obligation that we owe to the planet that, that gave us life. We generally understand, I think we all do, that humans possess special attributes of mental ability that sets us far apart from the animal kingdom. These attributes or endowments, as I call them, have enabled the human race to thrive for millennia and ultimately create the modern civilization that we now live in and enjoy. And remarkably, these endowments are also what mankind, humankind uniquely, it's also made us uniquely suited to and ready to extend our civilization into space. How incredible is that, right? Uh, in contemplating the, these human faculties, I've, I've identified six endowments that can be described as archetypes. And so for this portion of the talk, I think I will uh, share a few slides. And I hope you now can see those. Uh, and I believe that you can. All of these endowments that I'm speaking of are part of everyone. However, individually, 
we'll each tend to express one or two of these traits more strongly than the others. So it is the confluence of these endowments expressing throughout the population that has perpetually spurred our society and our technology forward throughout history. As, as I briefly described, each of these endowments, see for yourself which one of these you most identify with. All right, so we're going to start by. So let's start with the wanderer. The wanderer is the one who led the, his tribe some 60,000 years ago to leave the plains of Africa to populate every continent on the planet by 10,000 BCE. And she's also the one who desires to explore the craters of Mars and to travel to distant stars. The settler. The settler is ever on the lookout for a safe haven for her tribe where they can strengthen themselves and build a community. The settler is not interested merely in making a fortune in space. He wants to build communities out there where people can live and work safely and comfortably. The inventor. The inventor is the problem solver. He asks, how can I increase crop yield? How do I build a better hut that will withstand the heavy rains? The inventor will solve every problem and do whatever it takes to get us back to the moon safely and this time to stay. The builder. The builder is the artisan, the craftsman, the business executive, who's very good at performing the same type of job over and over again. The builder takes the ideas of the inventor and replicates them throughout society. And as a result, civilizations are born. The builder is, is, uh, will expand the first lunar colony, for example, from 100 citizens to 100 million. The visionary. The visionary is the artist, the conqueror, the entrepreneur who is willing to see the big possibilities for herself and her community and empire even. The visionary is the writer who can create a future world and space of such wonder and possibility that we are motivated to spend a lifetime trying to make a reality. And finally, the sixth endowment is the protector. The protector is determined to keep safe what we have built as a civilization so that we can continue to improve on it and move ourselves further into the future. She is the builder of the Great Wall of China, the Library of Alexandria, and NASA's uh, Planetary Protection Program. He is most interested in space settlement of space settlement because, because he sees that as the best way to ensure human survival. So, so these are the six endowments, right? So perhaps there are others that we can add to this or that we can that we can replace on this list. The essential point is that without even one of these endowments, not only would space travel have not been possible, but civilization as we know it would not have existed as well. So let me stop sharing that. Okay. So, so just think about how lucky we are, right? We just happen to have evolved the very traits that are needed to become a spacefaring civilization. Or maybe, just maybe, it wasn't luck. Could it be that these endowments emerged within the Homo sapien to enable us to fulfill an obligation to the planet, the very planet that gave us life? An obligation that was encoded in our DNA from the moment that we emerged on this planet. An obligation that is perhaps part of a much larger DNA code that, was, that has guided the very formation of the universe and everything in it. The central contention of my obligation hypothesis is that humankind serves a symbiotic role in spreading the seeds of life from this planet to other regions of space. Consider the oak tree. It can live for 50 years before shedding a single acorn and then 
will shed many, many thousands of acorns in just one season. Similarly, the evolution of life on Earth has been ongoing for nearly 4 billion years and has just arrived at a point where it is ready to shed its seeds of life. And to fulfill this reproductive process, the Earth needed an agent to, to build its seed pods and carry the seeds to other planetary shores. Of course, when I say seed pods, of course, I'm talking about rocket ships. And of course, the agent to do this is us. I admit that such a sweeping statement is challenging and it rings uh, of a guiding hand of a deity, but I assure you, it doesn't need to. It's possible, I think, to accept a theory of a deterministic universe that remains solidly in the realm of scientific inquiry. And that's pretty much where I stand on this. It seems that Elon Musk agrees that this, with this outlook at a press conference following the successful launch of astronauts aboard his SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket last May. He said, to extend life beyond Earth, we are life's agents in this regard. All creatures and the plants that exist here on Earth, we can bring them to other planets. Here, Musk is clearly using language from the obligation book. And the endowments, they are the magic sauce that enables us to fulfill this obligation as I just explained. So now here's the twist. Are these six endowments enough? After all, if we, if we are on a, some kind of predetermined journey to expand life beyond Earth, what happened in 1972 when the Apollo program was canceled? Shouldn't that program have been allowed to continue and wouldn't we have been much further along if it did? What's important here is this, although we are naturally moving in a direction towards space migration, we have been moving in that direction unconsciously. And because most of us are unconscious to the obligation imperative, planetary inertia or the attitude that we should remain on Earth is holding us back. Planetary inertia does not want us to go anywhere. And therefore, for us to be successful, we can't remain unconscious to the natural processes that are already taking place. In my book, I suggest that there is a seventh endowment that is emerging. This is the ability to evolve consciously into the future. The seventh endowment is about the recognizing the obligation to expand into space is already at work and consciously then taking steps to evolve into it. For the lack of a better term, this archetype I, I, archetype I call the conscious evolver. And by being awake to such a process that is already underway, we can then take responsibility to help accelerate the process. It is like, uh, it is, it is like any, any woman who becomes pregnant. There's a period of time when she has no idea that she's pregnant. Maybe she hopes and she suspects and, and so forth. Uh, maybe that's what she's trying to do. Maybe that's not what she's trying to do. But this is a period where the body has, uh, the, 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 the egg has been fertilized and the embryo is starting to form and processes are already underway. But there is a moment in that pregnancy where the mother realizes what's going on, right? It's a bit of a shock usually and a surprise. And at that point, once they are awake to that, that reality, then they take responsibility to make sure that that child is born into the world, in the, uh, has every chance to be born into the world in a healthy and full way. So when we, you know, it, it, you know, so so this is, so th that's a metaphor. So this is a higher level of conscious awareness, of course, if you're willing to allow yourself to become attuned with it. The previous six endowments can be very much focused on the me and mine. 
The seventh endowment and the eighth endowment, which I'll discuss a little in just a little bit, are about moving from the me to the we. And when I say we, this is the global we, and even the expansive we of the universe. This is the 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 we of the cosmic consciousness, where we are recognized that we are we are one with everything, and we are then responsible for everything, in some sense or another. While the conscious evolver endowment is essential to the space migration, I hope that you're also getting that it's essential for all aspects of human life and our relationship to the Earth and to each other and to the global community. Right, so it's not unique. To, to this, but it's but it's also endemic. It's also essential for uh, for space migration. To open yourself to the seventh endowment is to become impatient and even a little outraged about the pro that progress is too slow, right? And I, I recently heard a quote by giant James Baldwin, uh, the American novelist and essayist, who said, "To be a Negro in this country." And to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. I've always felt that there is a parallel between the civil rights movement and the space movement. And this James Baldwin quote really helped to crystallize the similarities to me. It comes down to the recognition that the way things are, are not the way that they should be. And that while getting to where things should be is not really all that difficult. The prevailing socioeconomic norms make getting there nearly impossible. The Black Lives Movement raised the consciousness of many white people and, and, and even myself, where we finally realized, there's finally a recognition uh, that, that and we can partly understand this rage that Baldwin is, speaks of. The awakened space advocate is conscious to the fact that humanity is meant to expand beyond this one planet without reservation or qualification. The more awake to this imperative we are, the more we will feel a sense of impatience, the more we will feel a kind of rage that our movement into space is taking far too long, longer than it should. A rage that wants to wake everyone up to this imperative so that we can finally achieve this multi-planetary existence. The seventh endowment was about as far as I went with the, um, was as far as I went with the first book. My sequel will cover the eighth endowment and that, and, and that I want to share with you today, especially, um, especially because I have recently come to the realization that the eighth endowment is very much linked to transhumanism in any area of, of study important, uh, which I know is very important to many people in this audience. Okay, in five minutes? Five minutes, yeah, oh yeah, I'm on track. Um, so, so this is the first time that I'm sharing the Eighth Endowment publicly, so please be, be a little bit kind in your, in your analysis. But the nature of this thing, of this endowment came to me right after I finished the, finished the book and I was contemplating, well, what would be the Eighth Endowment? And, and uh, I have to say that in the six years since uh, I, I, I conceived of the Eighth Endowment, my thinking on it really has not changed at all. So here it is. Essentially, the archetype of the Eighth Endowment is they who are concerned with the ongoing of the species and life in general. So here, ongoingness, Ongoingness is the operative term. This is the one who contemplates the well-being of our species and all life into the deep future. And I heard Cosmetin use that term, deep future, which is very critical here. Uh, they are willing to ask the question, what action can I or my society's leader take today that will help to ensure the ongoingness of my species for hundreds and thousands of years into the future? and they are willing to take action to set that course in motion. We could, say that, we could say that Isaac Asimov was the first to understand this idea of ongoingness in his famous Foundation Trilogy, for those who recall that important work. In his story, the main character, Harry Seldon, 
accurately predicts the fall of a galactic civilization, and he made arrangements for the rest restoration of that, of that civilization after its downfall some hundreds of years into the future. Exhibiting the ongoing endowment is similar to the protector endowment, except those exhibiting the eighth endowment are intent that whatever happens in the deep future, the ongoingness of life will and must be ensured. They are thinking two and three and more generations ahead about advanced life support systems, space agriculture, radiation protection, etc. Some, <clears throat> some space settlement advocates are surely expressing this ongoing endowment. I think for most advocates, and I think this is myself included, we're really focused on getting to, to that all important first toehold in space where the first substantial human habitat uh, will exist some 20, within a 20 to 30 year uh, horizon. So consideration of a deep future of a thousand years and what space civilization will look like really is, really I admit is, is even for me is a little hard to grasp. So the eighth endowment is never satisfied with how safe and secure space travel and space habitation currently is. They will always want, they will always work on systems on the systems, all systems on Earth, to ensure, to ensure indefinite sustainability of all ecosystems and social structures. So it's not just about space. And currently, uh, current conditions and the near future prospects are very frustrating for those who exhibit this endowment. So the eighth endowment applies to our species biology as well and how we might need or want to change into the deep future. It involves the potential for genetically enhanced existence, which may make, a, make us more adaptable to a future planetary in, environment. It relates to our increasing integration of biology and technology. As Elon Musk says, everyone is already a superhuman and a cyborg because of the technology that's already at our fingertips. Neural, neural implants will one day transform how we live and work to something that is really difficult for even us to consider, conceive of today. And of course, Martine's own work on up, uploading, uh, uploading all that makes us us into a mind, uh, to a mind file and ultimately inserting that into a robot is the beginning of the ultimate transformation. The implications of the endowment are particularly the seventh and eighth, go beyond space settlement and transhumanism, of course, they apply to improvement of every challenge we know to be important um, in, in, in extreme poverty, uh, including extreme poverty, social equity, healthcare, longevity, climate change, and so forth. And I just wanna, uh, just want to um, share my screen one more time and say my own, new, my own new initiative with the Beyond Earth Institute is how I am expressing an impatience in the fulfillment of the space migration obligation. The Beyond Earth Institute is focused on squarely on building the policy framework to enable the creation of the economically vibrant communities beyond Earth. For each of us that feels drawn to the space settlement mission, we can't be timid to, to assume that such a future is too far off to be concerned with today. There is no undertaking that is more serious as far as I'm concerned. So with that, I'll leave it there. Julio, I really appreciate your patience and uh, I hopefully have a time for a minute or two for some questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, yes, we certainly have. Huh? Um, like uh, five or six minutes for questions. Who wants to ask something to Steve? Otherwise, I will. No immediate question. So I have some, uh, more like an observation. At some point, uh, you expressed your, uh, hold on, someone is coming in. Uh, you expressed your uh, belief uh, 
in a deterministic universe that can be fully analyzed scientifically. Um, I do think that it is a little bit too restrictive, perhaps, because a non-deterministic universe can also be analyzed scientifically. And uh, a simple example of that is that uh, even if uh, uh, fundamental uh, quantum physics and uh, in a slightly different sense, uh, uh, dynamical system physics is uh, intrinsically non-deterministic as far as it seems. It can still be analyzed scientifically and uh, the proof is the fact that all the devices that uh, we build based on quantum physics uh, are uh, working and work exactly as we want them to work. Uh, I make this point to say that we can still do science in a non-deterministic universe, but at uh, the same time, it seems to me that a non-deterministic universe, while leaving the, the possibility of doing science uh, fully open, is uh, more open to what we could call uh, transcendence and spirituality. And uh, I find uh, in this uh, a confirmation that uh, the scientific and spiritual or religious worldviews do not have necessarily to be opposite, but can be two different ways of uh, saying essentially the same thing. What are your thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that, especially in that last point, Julio, that uh, there is a, I, I do see, especially through, as I mentioned at the beginning, through my own, my, my own explorations on the spiritual side, I think there is a sort of emerging of this understanding that there is not any kind of inconsistency, especially, through, especially in, in, in the sense of a, of a Buddhist kind of, uh, 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 sense of the of a higher consciousness um and i don't think that there's necessarily uh, you know by, by by suggesting that a a deterministic universe is can be looked at from a scientific perspective i i, I it's certainly I, I think that that's almost as valid as looking at the universe as one that is that is completely random and that everything basically came about through one grand accident and which which I, I think that there's a certain logic about that that is hard to really really grasp um so um and i and you know it's really for me it's it's all about you know what are the patterns you know what are the patterns in nature what are the patterns in the world around us you know and how do these and and i think that there should be a, a consistency of the the patterns that we see repeated in different dimensions and the different aspects we see it repeated um, within social groups within societies within small groups within within large groups and within within the biological context and within you know within the in, uh, within what's going on within an organism so and then and, and then what's going on within the greater universe and you see and i think the more i examine these these patterns the more it 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 comes to it, it, it I, I come to this kind of realization that there is this and i i call it for lack of a better term the a dna right of a universe so at the at the beginning at the very beginning of the big bang you know the essentially the the kind of universe that was going to emerge from that big bang was already kind of established the code of that if you will not exactly how each galaxy was exactly going to, to to work or that you and I at some point 14 billion years later would be in, engaging in this way necessarily, but the overall pattern that creatures like you and I on some kind on on various planets that were ready to accept ready to uh, nurture such life, you know, would come into being and then that we would 
we, we would have achieved a certain kind of complexity of thought and capability and so forth to engage in, if not exactly this way, a similar way, you know, so, so because we're living into this, into this, into this pattern. So that's what I'm kind of suggesting, you know, essentially with the broader obligation um, um, uh, thought exercise. Thank you very much, Steve. Does anyone have uh, a very quick question for Steve before we move on? It doesn't seem to be the case. So the last hour of our Terra Space Day is going to be an interactive uh, performance with uh, two speakers. One is uh, an old friend of mine, Natasha Vitamor, who uh, can be introduced in many different ways, but I like to think of Natasha as the transhumanist queen. The other is uh, Rachel Lyons, a Space for Humanity, uh, who uh, I believe uh, recently has been uh, awarded uh, uh, funding to do interesting things. And we look forward to hear about that. Uh, can I ask Natasha to switch her webcam on? Mm. In, in uh, the meantime, uh, uh, Rachel, are you going to use a slideshow or just speak? Yeah, I do have a slideshow. Here you do have a slideshow. Yeah. I know that Natasha has one, but I'm waiting for Natasha to switch on both her uh, webcam and microphone. Hi there, forgive me, uh, Mike. <laughs> I'm starting my video now. Hold on, just that's a minute. great. Hi, hi. Good to see everybody. It's good to see you. So in uh, the program, I use the alphabetic order by first name. So first uh, Natasha and then Rachel. So the idea is that uh, you to give uh, two presentations and then you discuss about the content. Huh? And uh, I'm going to give the floor to Natasha first and then Rachel. Natasha, how long do you plan to take for uh, the first part of the talk? I thought that 15 minutes would be sufficient time Is because that, that uh, give and I plenty of time to right. explain. Okay, so 15 minutes to Natasha, 15 minutes to Rachel, and then a discussion between the two. Natasha, the floor is yours. Okay, now I have to, um, this is, um, I had emailed you about this before. If I show my a PowerPoint, it takes over my screen. So. Uh, if, well, uh, I, there is an option. Uh, which version of PowerPoint are you using? The most recent. And on which operating system? I'm on a PC. You're on a PC. So if, uh, well, I'm on a Mac, so I cannot guide you 100%. But if you go under the slideshow. Uh, Usually yeah. when I, I give talks, I can show my slides and also see myself. <clears throat> um, uh, so this, uh, yeah. uh, this is not going to be a problem because uh, we are going to see you, even if you are not uh, uh, going to see yourself. So what I suggest is that if you don't find immediately the option to run the presentation in a window, you just do it full screen and we will see you. Well, fine. I need to have the share screen capability. You do, you have it. Okay. So, okay, I'm gonna share my screen and let's hope that this works uh, for you all. And I'll start my show from the beginning. That works. Okay, perfect. That's great. And I we see you this. just fine. If the world could be so sane and, and simple. Thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to sharing a bit of my story with you all. And I'm going to make it brief because it's just a piece of the story, but I think it's an important piece. I look forward to this day and I've enjoyed the talk so far and let this day be uh, a memory of our creative culture moving forward and exploring not only our solar system and the universe. 
The image here is Duchamp's new descending a staircase, and it set a precedent for cybernetics. And cybernetics, as we know, is the origination of the moving image outside of animation and of chemistry. It's that moving image that inspires me a great deal and was the precursor to the cubistic field in the arts, as well as the field of cybernetics brought into media design and virtuality. The advocacy to challenge and to create is part of our imagination. And I'm pleased to be part of that culture that sees this as fundamental. Uh, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I don't support because self-actualization is at the pinnacle, the top of the hierarchy. We live in a synergistic loop of information and exchange in a multi-dimensional universe. So there can be no hierarchy in that regard, but the symbiotic exchange of information leads this information in connecting our ideas. An idea I had in the early 1980s was to write a manifesto and after I wrote that manifesto about the future of humanity and space, I went to space camp. And this image stems from 1985. I was part of the first team of adults at space camp at the United States Space and Rocket Center at Tranquility Base. In this image, I'm seated between two astronauts. And my role, my assignment was to be the flight director. Yes, indeed, I was very nervous, very scared. But of course, there is a manuscript, a set of instructions that you follow to make sure that every detail is recognized and followed. So this is really exciting for me to become the flight director. I had no idea that would happen. And this is a time before Challenger, in fact, at space camp in 1985, we had two simulated mock-ups. One was Challenger and one was Discovery, and they were full-size mock-ups. I did achieve my wings, and I was very proud to have them. Um, it was a, a long, steady journey within a short amount of time, but the skills I learned there still stick with me today. I was required to function as part of the team in engineering repairs in the cargo bay um, in a zero G simulation. I had to perform research in a science lab in the mock-up shuttle and develop, create holograms. I also had to exercise, which I love to do anyway, but to go through the experience of maintaining um, my aerobic strength. And that was really fun to do. Uh, the award ceremony was fantastic, but it was just part of the journey. The award mattered less to me than the process of learning these skills with a team of, I think there were 12 of us in this program that launched the adult section of Space Camp. Here are three images of me that I took out of my scrapbook last night because they, they make me laugh. I, I think they're quite wonderful. Yes, this was me in 1985. Um, the first one on the far side of the screen is me in the cargo bay attached to a zero G simulator. And I'm trying to do repairs. Mind you, if I let go of anything I'm holding onto, it would float out into space as if we were really in space. So because I was in the cargo bay, I was ever so mindful not to let go of anything I was holding onto uh, for security. The middle image, I'm setting up the exercise um, capabilities. We had treadmills and, and other machines to uh, work out with. And um, of course, that was great fun for me. And in the uh, final image, I'm in the lab in the, um, in the mock-up spacecraft. And this is where I'm working under a microscope and working with my chemical agents and uh, different protocols, including sand, to develop the hologram. So those are just three experiences that helped carve who I am today. And even though that was midterm in my life, 
I think that, and I, I truly believe that these pinnacles of experiences help carve us and continue to carve us and where we're going and how we can be better aligned with culture and seeing and understanding more mindfully and with uh, you know, a greater consciousness about the world around us. So the that's just part of a, a story and it continues onward. The stories we tell act like an operating system that impacts culture. And it's not always an uphill climb, but big ideas take courage. They challenge us and they really require us to change the way we think about things. Not that the way we think about things is incorrect, to be sure, but it adds more substance, more knowledge, more information, more intelligence, more kindness and love to the world that we're in. So the vision to launch an idea into the solar system was my next big plan and um, became a story about the future of humanity. And I was very fortunate to have been um, associated with the Space Museum in Los Angeles and uh, many of my dear friends were deeply involved in the space industry, including Space Tourism, which is run by John Spencer in Los Angeles. And he and Charlie Carr, the director of technology at the Museum of Technology, which has the space program there, um, encouraged me to follow my dreams. So in following my dreams, I took the writing that I had created in 1982, 1983, which was a manifesto about the future of humanity. And I submitted it to be on board the Cassini Huggins spacecraft on its journey or its mission to the rings of Saturn in outer space. And it was accepted. That was a daunting challenge because I had no idea if it would be accepted or not. But I think that what encouraged me so much was that, that it was in fact a challenge. And because I didn't know anyone at that time at NASA or the ASA or the Italian Space Agency, the three organizations that put together this mission, it was really um, exciting when I found out that my uh, writing had been accepted on this, uh, this mission. So here you see the cover of the disc that my writing is on and it says the, the EESA and then Huggins and in various languages, your signature into space. And um, to the side of that is the disc that um, went into space. The sad news and, and Martine and Bina will totally understand this. I have the disc here. And unfortunately, my latest, my newest, I should say, golden doodle puppy bit into it. So I have to take it to an engineer to see if it can be saved. If not, I'll, I have the memory and at least I have the images. So that's part of that journey to continue on. It wasn't that just going through a, a simulated mission was enough. I needed to get the words out into space. And as an author and a, a creative thinker, and someone who's exceedingly passionate about culture and the future of humanity, and uh, our relationship with the ecosystems in which we do exist and will exist is very important, that was likewise. So here I'm showing you the trajectory of the mission as it gains momentum and gravitational fields and then um, is sent out into uh, the outer rings of Saturn. And part of the manifesto starts with, I am transhuman. I aim to integrate creativity and reason for the purpose of self-awareness and longevity, uh, promoted by persistence, aware of odds, informed by risk, alert to new discovery, welcoming challenge, ever-changing I become. And that's still a sentiment I have today. We are animals, biological human, homo sapiens, homo spacians, I should say, but we're something other. We've been merging with machines for decades. And the human machine has been uh, recognized in science fiction and uh, all sorts of academic, scientific, and technological um, acknowledgements, and even uh, philosophically addressed in looking at what is existence. 
And I defer to one of my favorite influencers who is uh, Dr. Lynn Margulis in her book, What is Life? where she talks about the conglomeration of bacterium in forming life. And I think that we continue to be a um, conglomeration of ideas and processes and evolving continually. So as the architect of my existence, I continue to learn and to gain knowledge and to become more aware and work toward helping create this future culture of humanity that I think can become something we'll all enjoy being part of. So here you have the Nembic and this DNA of all life forms in moving forward. Thank you so much, Kilio. I look forward to Rachel's presentation. Should I, should I just hop in? Or Julio, you're muted. <laughs> yes, the floor is yours, just uh, hoping. Great, great. Um, Natasha, thank you for that. That was fantastic. Yeah, um, and thank you for having me. It's good to be here and see a lot of names of people that I haven't met before, but. I've heard of just doing really important work. So really um, honored and grateful to be here. Let me get my slide deck out. So my presentation is a little bit um, focused on space for humanity and my work with the organization. Uh, Natasha, I love how much you touched on culture because that's actually like the basis of what I'll be talking about. Um, and how space and the space perspective can shift culture and has shifted culture and will shift culture. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna do this. And then if I play it, can you see it as a presentation right now? Okay, cool. Yes, okay. we can. Beautiful, thank you, Julio. Um, so yeah, as, you, as stated, my name is Rachel Lyons. I am the Executive Director of Space for Humanity. Space for Humanity is a nonprofit organization working to sponsor leaders from all over the world to go to space commercially with Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin or the Space Perspective or other companies as capabilities evolve so that they can go and have this transformative experience of viewing our planet from space and then come, come back down and be seated, seated all around the world to go and share this perspective far and wide. So it all ties back into culture, which is why I was just loving what you were sharing, Natasha. And our, um, our motto is to space for Earth. So it's going to space for the benefit of life on Earth. So um, going back to the Apollo era, I'm sure some of you remember, everyone heard about when we first went around the moon and we came back around the other side. And for the first time ever, we saw this Earthrise image this image of the earth as a marble in the sky, like so small that the astronauts over here could cover it with their thumb. And this image was plastered across screens, the front of newspapers, the front of magazines. Um, and it was, it caused a mass, I'll use the word awakening um, societally, like people had never seen the earth from this context. And many historians say that this Earthrise image and seeing the Earth from this context actually sparked the modern environmental movement. And just some things that point to that is that within three years of this image being taken, the Environmental Protection Agency was founded, Earth Day was founded, a number of leading organizations in the modern environmental movement was founded, um, Doctors Without Borders was founded, which that phrase, without borders, did not exist before this image was taken. And a number of acts specifically around preservation of our environment were enacted within a few years of that image. And so why is it? Why is it that this image is said to have sparked all of this? Well, from a systems theory lens, this image actually created a collective paradigm shift. It created a, a collective awakening. So. We, so as a society, we no longer held the same worldview after seeing this image. And so to, to 
go a little bit more into it, I'm going to go into it from a systems thinking lens, which I'm sure that a lot of people here are interested in systems thinking because because as space people, it's like Earth is a complex system. Earth is the largest system that we are a part of that we can impact at this moment. Um, and when going into complex systems theory, I was pointed to a woman's work named Danella Meadows. And Danella is a systems change expert that actually passed away in the early 2000s. Um, and in her work, she talks about how all complex systems have leverage points. And what leverage points are, are they are places within a complex system where small shifts can lead to big change. And what she talks about in her studies about leverage points, she maps out 12 leverage points in a complex system. In the two most powerful places where those small shifts can lead to big change are one, around transcending paradigms and two is around recognizing the mindset or the paradigm out of which the system arises. And so both number one and number two, the two most powerful ways to create larger changes in the complex system are around transcending paradigms and recognizing the paradigm that, that we exist in, which this image caused, as I said, a collective paradigm shift, which is why it, it created those shifts in the systems that exist here. Um, so this is something that we're all working to do is, is use this co a collective paradigm shift to create a greater shift in society, to create shifts that allow us to address our most complex issues that all are happening, happening from this global scale. Um, these are some of the people who are behind what we're doing. Um, just, yeah, an amazing group of people, NASA astronauts, our founder Dylan Taylor is known as the most active space investor in the world. He's, um, I'm just endlessly inspired by his work. Um, and my team is a team of humanitarians as well as space people. So it's kind of, a two space for earth is also shown in the people that are working to make this happen. And what brings us all together is this concept called the overview effect. Um, have people here heard about the overview effect? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just quickly go over it. Um, it's, it's becoming more and more recognized. Like every day I'm seeing more articles being published about it, more people speaking to it. It's really an amazing time. This concept is starting to get more and more recognition. So the definition of the overview effect is that it is the cognitive shift in awareness that happens to astronauts when they go to space and they see our planet as a beautiful fragile interconnected planet floating in the universe. And this overview effect experience causes um, a, this a cognitive shift and awakening a paradigm shift. So going back to the complex systems leverage points, by giving more and more people access to this perspective, we can begin to create shifts in the systems that we exist in. Um, here's a quote from Nicole Stott, astronaut Nicole Stott, who's on our advisory board saying, from her experiences in space, you realize that you're not from Florida or the United States. You're an earthling. The bottom, the bottom line is we are all earthlings. So this is just, this is a prime example of the paradigm shift, going from an identity that includes you living in Florida or the US to one that includes the whole earth. Um, and so I think just what I'll touch on is, is so from the psychological individual perspective, we're working with a researcher out of Johns Hopkins, his name is David Yaden, and he's done research on the psychological impact of this experience on astronauts. And he um, talks about that there's three things, three things that characterize the astronaut experience. The first is the appreciation and perception of beauty. The second is unexpected and even overwhelming emotion from this experience. And the third is an increased sense of connection to people and to the earth as a whole. And he also has studied the type of psychological characteristics that make someone more susceptible to the overview effect. And so that's something that we are screening for when people apply to our program. Um, and then we're working with a PhD out of University of Michigan. Her name's Lynette Shaw, oops, she's brilliant. Um, and I'm, I'm wanting to read this quote, but it, my screen's cut off right now. But she basically says that 
you, you all can read it, but it's extremely important that we allow as many people as possible to have access to this experience, as well as in seeding them around the world to share this perspective far and wide. And she says that this is actually one of the most important things that we can do to ensure the survival of our species. Um, and as you all know, it's amazing. I made, actually made this slide months ago, and now it's like within the past you know, week and a half, both Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, as of this morning, have successfully flown fully crewed flights. And we are truly at this cusp of a new era in space exploration. The space perspective will be flying within the next few years. Um, Virgin Galactic and Blue will, their, you know, their commercial flights will be starting very soon. And um, yeah, it, it, is, it is an unprecedented moment in human history, as well as just in the history of life. You know, it's like, it's amazing that we are achieving this right now. And, and to be um, all of us here, to be a part of this moment is really, really awe-inspiring. Um, so Space for Humanity is working, as I said, to sponsor people to go and have this experience that are gonna, and then have them come back down and share it far and wide. Um, I don't think I need, I'm not gonna go too much into this right now, but just, yeah, I think we're gonna we're, we're gonna skip that part. Um, so we are, in short, expanding access to space by enabling people from all over the world to have access to it. Um, we'll also be having them each go through a special leadership training program. So um, astronauts up until now have been trained for their work when they go to space. You know the 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 experiments that they carry out or or the work that they're doing or something else. Us for our training program, we're training them for the work that they do when they return. That is what our program's about. Um, and then of course, collaboration is a really important part of what we're doing. And we know that we can't succeed unless we work with um, all the other organizations that are like minded and working to do the similar things. Um, this is a little bit more about our programs. If anyone has questions about it, feel free to ask me. Um, yeah, I'm in, in particular, I'm really excited about our leadership training program because I think it's just like astronauts are this incredible resource of wisdom by having this experience. It's like, this is a deep wisdom, a deep truth of our existence. And, and that needs to be something that is utilized. Um, and then of course, collaboration, as I said, we have many partners all around the world that we're working with and um, are thrilled about continuing to expand our network. Um, these are some of our program focuses, which I also don't need to go into, but I can send the deck to anyone who's interested. Um, these are the sustainable development goals that our program addresses. Um, and just in short, to, to wrap it all up, and put a bow on it, what we're doing is we're working to create a culture of interconnectedness. So one where people actually understand this reality of our existence so that we can set the stage for the world that we want, both here on earth, as well as throughout the cosmos. Um, yeah, and so thank you all again for having me. I'm really interested in learning more about all of your work as well. And I'm looking forward to the conversation with Natasha. Am I, are we waiting for you, Julio? No, the floor is yours. The floor is, okay, great. Hi there, enjoyed your presentation very much, Rachel. It's inspirational. Thank you. Yeah, it, and it's nice to meet you. Um, so is this, are we, are we just chatting or are we being prompted with questions? Let's just start by chatting. <clears throat> I could okay. just chat or maybe ask questions to each other. Okay, one of the, the, the concerns that Gabe and, and uh, the team had was, you know, about being a woman in as a homo sapiens and some of the, the, the differences because most in the, in the past historically I look at it's, it's more male dominated, but I didn't want to focus on that because um, I'm not into any of, of that, but I think it's really important that we're here and they had the, the sensibility to invite us with uh, um, some astute thinkers. Otherwise, uh, 
there is a a certain presence that I think uh, is beyond any of the changes that we're seeing in culture today or around the world, and that is the the individual sense of hope. And I think that you allude to that within your presentation, but it's not just hope, it has to be organized. And without being organized with having a goal and an aim and a set of priorities, um, it, it falters. And then we just have people standing on their soapboxes. So what I think that, and you recognize this in your presentation, Rachel, the just this past week, um, looking at, you know, the the exuberance towards space and people talking about it is so important that to have this event um, being part of that is amazing to me. But uh, so let me ask you, Rachel, what do you think that we can do to better pull people from the negativity in culture and looking at all the, the downsides of the news towards being part of our, our, our cultures that we're creating towards um, a, um, a better way to look at the world. And I probably, I think that the best way to say that is the, the overview effect. How can we do that just from ground zero here on earth without going into space first until we get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would love to hear your answer to that as well, Natasha. Um, so I can, I'll share a little bit about my personal story. Um, I, as a kid, I never had an interest in space. It was not just not something that I cared about or even felt was real. It was a science class was me learning and, or yeah, learning and regurgitating or memorizing and regurgitating <laughs> information. Um, and then when I was 19 years old, I watched uh, the first episode of Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos. Mm -hmm. And in, in that he shows the scale of the universe starting from the earth and going out and out and out and out. And it, caused a huge cognitive shift for me or awakening or um, paradigm shift. And I suddenly saw this reality of our existence. And suddenly I had this relationship to all human beings because I saw that we share this planet together and how important it is that we take care of our planet because it's so special. And, and suddenly it was like, I would wake up in the morning in gratitude because I couldn't believe that we're here. And, um, and that happened to me just from watching this documentary. And so I think that it, when you talk about hope and you talk about the overview effect, um, I think with commercial space flight, it is, we have this opportunity for, I mean, the, like the masses are listening, whether they're being critical or supportive, they're, they're listening. So I think with the rise of commercial space flight, we have the opportunity to really make this perspective accessible to people. Um, so that's incredibly exciting. And I also think that there's so many ways that people can access it, you know? Like the way that I'm, I'm doing it and the opportunity that we have right now is via commercial space flight. And our founder talks about, it's like people can, they, you can shift your perspective from going on a hike and and looking oh. out from out and top and you can do it from going deep in meditation you can do it from other um, kinds of things and you know there's it, I did it with a documentary so so there's a lot of ways that we can create that hope and I think it's about it's it, from a systems thinking lens this is something that Lynette Shaw the PhD we work with um, talks about it is the more that we can share our perspective like the more that we identify with with um, yeah, like a, sh a sh the more that we identified with the shared culture or identity, the more that we can actually, you know, so, like um, transcend the current challenges that we have. So it's not an us versus them kind of thing. It's a, we all share this planet together. We're all earthlings, as Nicole Stott said. Yes, I'd like to see that overview effect move away from, um, not that it's not important, but so much counterculture and, and wokeness and um, focus on, um, the fears around us, the wars and, and the climate shifts and the in, inequities amongst people and focus on bringing about, it's almost like, a, it's almost like a singularity in that regard. It's just, you know, just somehow overnight where people just go, aha, and get it. And I equate that to, um, as you described, the um, you know, three different uh, perspectives or paradigmatic shifts that astronauts had in their better understanding of beauty and community after having going out into space. You know, it's very interesting. I had a similar experience. Um, 
I've always been an explorer. So I've, uh, it's, it's something I've, I've always been. So it was not any major shift for me, but I do remember I was living in a ski resort in, in Colorado and I wanted to ski down the longest and steepest slope in North America. And I did, I fell a lot and broke two thumbs. But what I did after that is I joined the Merchant Marines because I realized I had to toughen up. Um, from my background, it was always, you know, more the social life and, and beauty contests and all of that. And so when I joined the Merchant Marines, it was very exciting for me because I was out at sea for three months without seeing land. And out at sea, I'd walk the, you know, the, the deck um, and I would just see the horizon and it was round because, you know, you just continue around it. And I think that was my epiphany that this that it's obtainable here and I'm floating on this body of water, which really scared the heck out of me. But because I was in the Merchant Marines and it was my job, I couldn't you know, show my fear. I just had to become one with it. And I, I really love your, your uh, refer, uh, reference to yoga and more like Zen. Um, I practiced yoga for years and I think that it's, it's that emotion within the body and having the body do things, um, whether it's skiing or yoga or dance, that um, informs us more about our own perceptions and sensibilities. Because when you're in space, you know, the body is there and it is important. And if and if it's not exercised and, and uh, challenged, you know, it's, it's, we're in pretty bad shape. So it brings us to the idea of Manfred Klein and Nathan Klein and the cyborg and um, you know, I teach and I have students um, and they keep on getting confused with the, the term of cyborg and what it means in science fiction or in postmodernist rhetoric and academic um, as a feminist political perspective versus Manfred Klein and Nathan Klein's original concept of the cyborg, which was to augment the human body so we wouldn't suffer from um, radiation and zero G. So uh, do you have any thoughts on that? And how do you see um, a comparable between the early concept of cyborg, which is a concept I refer to, and the idea of the transhuman in maybe enhancing or augmenting our body so that we are more adaptable to space. Um, it's, I would say that it's not totally an area of study of mine, and I would love to hear if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I and I think it's, it's you, but go, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm so intrigued um, because when you, I mean, certainly astronauts, when they get back, they have to deal with their body once again. And if we're out there for longer periods of time, we're going to have to deal with that. And I think of Martine and her, you know, beisms and, you know, the idea of, of cybernetic space. And this is very separate and apart from the computational concept of uploading a whole brain emulation. And mind you, that is a whole nother area that I think deserves a focus and support because we do need to back up our memories. And they're precious to us. <laughs> um, but if we go into space, I mean, the spacesuits that we have are okay, but they're not doing enough to better protect our bodies. So um, I think that's an area that I would certainly not, I don't wanna take our time here, but um, engage in more deeply um, because it is a concern and it is beyond gender um, specifics and it has no particular ethnicity or race or, or, or weight or, or style. It just is what our, our basic humanity needs. So that we can save that for another time. The other um, topic I thought would be really interesting is uh, in, your, in your talk and in my talk, we talked about um, humanity and being more humanitarian. And I struggle with that because as a transhumanist, in my view, the, the more mindful and kinder and generous and uh, humble we are, the better. But we have to share that experience of the, uh, the overview effect in some way. And it is a bit of a humanitarian stretch but the humanitarian is missing the very element that is at the heart of both of our talks, which is being more humane. One, just because one is a humanitarian does not mean that one is humane. So um, how is your project um, addressing this element of humaneness? That's a great question, Natasha. Um, so, um, 
yeah it's a big question too because I'm just thinking I'm thinking like one thing that I like talking about is how you know when we first went to the moon and we stuck a flag in it and made it about America and a lot of people say, it's like when I talk about space travel and going in and going off planet um as probably every single person here knows one of the most common responses is like we've got enough problems on our planet why would we right. go and go to another one um and one thing that I got so Frank White he's the person who coined the term overview effect mm -hmm. and he also wrote a book called the Cosmo hypothesis that he actually published probably two years ago now um and, and in it one thing that I got from it he talks about how we've made space exploration up until this point all about humanity you know and which I think this might be what you're pointing to and when in reality what I believe is that it's not actually about humanity it's about the possibility of life in the universe yes you know exactly yeah so it's like we might we don't I, I don't know too much about what our biological forms could look like when we go off planet but I know that it's like maybe we won't yeah maybe we won't identify as humans anymore it, you know but but all I know is that by going off planet it's yeah it's not about humanity it's about the possibility of life in the universe yes absolutely and, beautifully stated Rachel thank you so much for summing it up that way so yeah I mean and I mean the, the, the one of the core issues and and most of us are dealing with this when people say oh it's too bad here we have to stop wars we have to you know give rights to people, the, all the inequities. Yes, of course we have to do that, but that cannot stop us from going out into space. It's our drive, it's our purpose, and um, we're explorers by nature, so uh, it makes sense. Um, how do you feel about space being so expensive and the emphasis being put on when it's talked about so-and-so is going into space or this space, and then it mentions that they're billionaires? Does that kind of, uh, um, put a an, an icky feeling on it? Do we have to say how much someone is worth when they go out into space? I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just want to go back to what we were talking about before, and then I'll sure. definitely answer that question as well. Um, so just talking about how, yeah, it's like people think it's, they don't, uh, some people don't see that it's, um, it's we can go to space and like steward our planet, you know, we can go to space and treat, treat each other with more respect, you know? So, and one thing that we talk about a lot of space for humanity is by ha by fundamentally shifting our perspective, like on an individual basis, we can shift our beliefs yeah. and then that will have a shift our behavior and the way that we interact with each other. And then by shifting our behavior collectively, that's actually how we create culture shifts. And that's how we begin to solve these seemingly intractable challenges that are all happening from this global scale because we actually need to be looking at it from that perspective. Um, yeah, and so I, I'll, I, I'll definitely answer that billionaire question. And I also just am like wanting to hear more, Natasha, about your perspective on Culture. On that shifting, on that culture yeah, shift. shifting, yeah. And you know, religious didn't accomplishment. I, mm -hmm. I respect her in church, and I think that we're all part of of this sensibility about that. Um, that is is sponsoring this event with with terrorism. The um, that's so important to have some kind of belief and some kind of moral compass. But religion hasn't done it so far. And then people go, oh well, it's religion or politics. Well, I haven't found a political structure that actually works well for the humaneness of humanity within the whole ecological system of all life forms and future life forms. So something's amiss. And, and then there's these movements, the antinatalism movement, which is pretty strange. And there's people who are for the extinction of humanity because we've caused all the problems. Well, in my view, humanity has not caused all the problems. It's how we use the tools that have helped us achieve successes and opportunities that cause problems. And Mother Nature has not been so kind herself. If we want to anthropomorphize nature to be Mother Nature, it's uh, Mother Nature's uh, a, a pretty strong will to to you know wrestle with. So it's not humans that cause all the problems, but I think it's imperative that we figure out a way to communicate to build this culture that we're we're, we're both 
uh, envisioning because nothing's working so far. And all the social media is even breaking it down further because social media offers an opportunity for people to be negative and criticize and send out negative messages. And so that concerns me. So the question for a, a, a think tank or a brainstorm um, with some highly creative people across disciplines would be, what can we do? Is it making a big movie? Documentaries are great and I love them. And I used to watch Carl Sagan every week you know, on, on Cosmos uh, like you uh, with a different uh, narrator or you know, a producer. Mm -hmm. so what is that message? People seem to want to gyrate towards the negative. Is it just we need to become more enlightened and is that an evolutionary thing? Or do you think that we can bring about this, um, this overview effect that will, will uh, um, shift down into culture to cause people to want to, to change? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so it's such a good question. And yeah, I'm like wanting to ask you a lot of bazillion things about this as well. <laughs> um, well, so I would say from my perspective is that we can't, I, I don't think that we can shove worldviews or ideals in people's faces, you know? And so like what space for humanity is doing is it's, it's almost like, it's like we're a blank slate. Like, it's like, go and have this perspective. And now, like, what do you want to do with it? Like, how does this change your worldview? How can you now share this with people that relate to you? And, and um, yeah, like people in your communities yeah. that relate to you and love you and respect you. Um, we're not, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to, I'm like politically and, and in terms of like, com like the complex issues that we face, I actually, we typically don't, um, make strong statements about things that are polarizing because what I want is just to have people gain this perspective and then decide what what they want to do with it and how that shifts their worldview and um and I think that at, that's my role at this moment like I think that's that's the best that yeah but that role is one I think that most of us should take as as leaders and there's this term influencer which is bandied around a lot <laughs> it kind of makes me giggle um the best way we can influence is by not dictating the way people ought to be mm -hmm. and not setting uh, harsh parameters around what we accept or not accept even if it is for equity or equality don't force that down people's throats because people People learn at their own rate and are influenced by the world around them. So setting an example, I always thought was the best thing to do by seeding it, but you can't do that sitting in your, your, the, your, on your own sofa. You gotta go out into the world. And I think it's a you know, responsibility of those of us who, who do see that the shift needs to be made to get out there and do it and not fight those political, religious, socio-ecological battles, but to, mm -hmm as you say, leave that open slate or open canvas where ideas are welcome, but to be careful when negativity comes in to remove it. You know, yesterday I gave a, a session, I think it was yesterday, no, I, I can't remember, the days kind of blur, um, on the future of culture. And uh, I had one person in the chat window who kept on writing negative comments and I couldn't, I couldn't be in charge of it and remove that person. I didn't want to remove that person. And I was scared if I said something, it would be blasted out to everyone. And so I was trying to be respectful of the negative person, but at the same time, try to steer the audience away from that type of discourse. And I think that that is just a, a microscopic view of the larger world and, and it just steer people away from going into those polarizations. Um, and stay focused on the goal. Just you know, bring it back. You know, bring it back. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's how often do astronauts come back down? I mean, like astronaut Ron Garen, for example. He's on our advisory board. Actually, I live in Boulder, and he he also he like lived up two miles from me. Um, but that's one of the biggest thing that he talks about in his book, Orbital Perspective. And he's actually about to release another book, or I think he just did. It's called Floating in Darkness, and has Love a the really, title. Yeah, it's like an it's like an amazing. Yeah, every time I talk to him, it's like my mind is blown. He has the most transcendent, expansive perspective ever. Um, and and he talks in floating in darkness is like, you know, five plus years of integrating his overview effect experience to come to these mm -hmm. like realizations about our existence. And um, yeah, so I haven't gotten the chance to read it yet, but um, I'm I, 
seeing him at an event next month and I'm going to get a book from him. Anywho. You know oh, he, no, no, that's really important because when you said floating in darkness, it was very visual for me. And I was thinking yeah. about Carl Sagan again's Demon Haunted World, um, Signs as a Candle in the Dark. And I, I, I do, I think about that on a daily basis. Somewhere in my, in my daily routine, that Signs as a Candle in the Dark comes up. And then the demon haunted world around us is full of all that stuff, but you've got to keep on shining that, that candle mm -hmm. or the light or being the light that shines. Mm -hmm. um, wow, I just had a couple of highly creative ideas. I don't, <laughs> again, this is so, so stimulating and wonderful to talk with you. Um, and I love this, this open format. So you're in Boulder, I used to live in Boulder and I mentioned Telluride. So you probably mm -hmm. are familiar with Telluride, but it's, it's those environments that, that, that challenge us um, so much. Um, and this environment here in Scottsdale, it's, you know, gets to be so hot, but um, the environments that affect us emotionally um, are one thing and when the environment of social media and this interlay between uh, virtuality um, is really important. So how to um, profit from that as a humaneness investment rather than a monetary investment uh, might be to look at the gamification of this uh, overview effect and what is brought back. If we want to share mm -hmm. uh, this feeling to create a paradigmatic shift um, as for everyone, it has to cost almost nothing mm -hmm. and it has to be available. Well, now we know, and I have many students and we have someone here in the session from Nigeria. Sometimes um, the, the internet connection is not so good or it's hard to get, but now it's pretty pretty much um, settled. It's, it's, it's much more fluid than it was once. But if we could create a game that could give that sensation, not a first shooter killer game, um, not one of those, um, but some, an experiential game. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think about uh, Digital Hollywood in the 19, early 1990s. Uh, downtown Los Angeles was this uh, electronic arts design architecture, a storytelling event. And I remember the first time I saw augmented reality actually evolving. And it was the work of two French designers or cybernetic designers who created these algorithms that were in this like body of water, which was about two feet by four feet. And you could see the algorithms that took on shapes like circles and round shapes and squares and triangles. And if they merged, they would evolve into a new shape or they might you know, diminish or kill off the other one. So you were always hoping they would merge to evolve into a new shape. That was very beautiful. But the, the, the reason I'm referring to that is, is that even over the past decades, the many decades that we've experienced um, the uh, space and stepping on the moon and, and putting the flag there and <laughs> kind of pissing on the moon, my territory. But to where we are now, we're seeing that it's a world open for so many. It's not just governments, it's private industry and, and citizens and people that are now part of this instead of being owned by anyone, which is so exciting mm -hmm. that, that um, we need to include a way for people who can't go or are, are not as excited, but to, in, um, to inspire them perhaps. So I think that, that gaming is, is one really wonderful, um, probably piece of that puzzle that, that could be assimilated rather than, um, I guess TV is still a, a good medium. I still watch it for research. It tells me, it gives me, puts a finger on the pulse of, of where culture is headed. I try to stay away from social media because inevitably there's something that's going to be said that's going to um, be strange and I don't wanna hear. So um, how do you think that we, we could use the, um, the accoutrements or the, the technologies of the, these digital cybernetic electronic kin kinetic gaming or VR AR world of, of, of storytelling to bring this to um, more people? Um, that's a great question. So, well, one thing that I say, I'll say um, is that I think that the, the power of them or like the power of a bringing that experience via VR or something like that in a way that's not 
um, yeah, social media is definitely tough because, you know, people take really strong like political stances and, and, and one thing that we don't want to do is be polarizing in any way. It's like, yeah, like I was saying before, it's like we bring this worldview and then you get to decide yeah. what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, a woman on our um, board of directors, her name is Claudia Wells. She's the chairman of IONS, which is the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And that was yeah, found yeah. by Edgar Mitchell after he, in, in Claudia's words, which I think came straight from Edgar, he had an, an, an embodied experience of oneness after going around the moon and seeing the earth, which is also known um, as a Samadhi experience, which is from, um, a, I think from an Eastern religion, it basically means that an experience of oneness. Yeah. Um, and she basically is, she produced a um, VR experience. I think it's called the Edgar Mitchell VR experience. And um, you just, it's exactly that. Like, it's just, they, without, you know, all the only words are Edgar Mitchell talking about his experience, which is very poetic, Carl Sagan-esque, I would say. Yeah, right. Yes. Um, and then, and then the visuals are just, are like you going around the moon and coming back around the other side and looking back at the earth and there's like very expansive music playing and, and it, it made me cry just experiencing it. And um, so that's, there's, and then I've been approached probably, I don't know, I would say six to a dozen times with different space VR things that people are doing that actually just, they, it just puts you there. You know, it just puts you in space and then you like, you know, you get to decide the meaning that you make of it. So, yeah. And then there's like the documentary, like the scientific documentaries, like the Cosmos from Carl Sagan or from Neil deGrasse Tyson and other ones. And um, there's some really cool space documentaries on Netflix, too. Like there was one I was just scrolling through about um, imagining aliens on other worlds and, and what that could look like. And I think that's the most expansive kind of thought experiment, you know, being like, wow, like we know what biological life looks like on this planet and imagine something with slightly different, um, a slightly different environment. What might that look like? And that is humbling, you know, it, it, it's, it's humbling and expansive just to put your mind there. So I think there's a lot of different ways that people can bring this. And, and in terms of gamification of it, I don't, um, I don't fully, I don't fully know what that would look like. Um, but I do know like via virtual um, means, there's many ways that we can bring it to people. I think that that's precisely what it would do. Gamification and just would be to put any anything that's in this material physical world into the virtual um, augmented world through um, code rather than um, chemistry. So, you know, yeah, gamification is a, is a broader term in that way. And I, I it, the way games are going right now, and I only know this because at the university where I've been teaching for almost a decade, gaming is gaming and cybersecurity are the two biggest fields that students are getting their degrees in, both undergrad and grad level. Uh, cybersecurity, very important. Gaming, it, there's not enough jobs there to suffice the, the number of students. But what's exciting is, um, the, the direction towards uh, machine learning in games as well as augmented reality. It's skipped beyond virtual reality to augmented reality. And I've experienced some of those games and they're, they're, they're a lot of fun, um, but I, I'm not too much a, a fan of, of the, the highly competitive aspect of it to, for bragger rights. Mm -hmm. I prefer the competitive aspect of it to compete with yourself. It's, yeah. For me, it's like I always use skiing down uh, the mountain as an example because you're there by yourself with those moguls and how you turn your skis and plant your pole is going to make the difference between, you know, whether you get down to the bottom <laughs> or go off the side of the mountain, which I have done. Um, so it's, it's um, I think that that's an area that, that, that might be helpful. Um, you know, it's interesting what, what happened to the bookstores. I used to sit in bookstores for hours and I used to go to libraries for hours. And that's how I even did all my research on the, the concept of the transhuman and found out with my mother, um, who was an intellectual. Um, we both hunted and hunted through the library for any reference and found out that the term transhuman stemmed from Alighieri Dante in um, you know, his um, divine comedy, which was so bizarre and strange and wonderful, and that it was the transcendence of our human, our human um, 
issues that we face on an emotional basis, largely, uh, that needed to be transcended through hell and then through Paradiso um, to heaven, to where we come to grips with who we are in our transcendence. And it's, it's so interesting um, to think of how that term like human, transhuman, posthuman, cyborg, these terms are used, but the bottom are our beism, but the bottom line is we don't know what we're going to become. We just have to experience it first and then see how we evolved. Um, I'm sure the early hominids and the Australopithecus didn't ponder, you know, what, <laughs> how humans would develop beautiful earrings like you have on or the ones that I didn't have time to put on, like what's here. It's, you know, the uh oh, you just muted yourself. Sorry. That come with culture and seeing how the the articles of aesthetics better please us and 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 encourage us to to have that emotional capability. One thing that concerns me about space is is those who may um, squabble with it or say we have to solve problems on Earth may not realize that in order to solve problems on Earth we have to overcome our own emotional inadequacies. And to overcome our emotional inadequacies, we have to evolve in some way or some form. Either we overnight become enlightened or we have a paradigmatic shift or the, the uh, overview effect somehow happens or something happens that alters, that shifts um, a small mind to a, an open mind. And I, I think that you know, if we had a magic wand, that would be something that we would love to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm fully, I'm in full agreement with, with all of that. Uh, yeah. And, and for me, it's like around reaching enlightenment or the overview effect, as I said, it's like, it is a clear way to, to evolve um, our minds and to expand as a species. And, and so that's the way that I'm doing it right now. And that's the way that I think a lot of us here are doing it. And I think that there's many other ways that we can bring that kind of perspective shift to people. Um, I'm also being cognizant of the time. We're at 11.03 yes. time and, and I do have another call. Um, so I just wanted to say, Natasha, it was so lovely to chat with you. I'm so glad that we got this time and just so interesting to hear your perspective. And yeah. I've so enjoyed talking with you, Rachel. And I, I look forward to collaborating on something in the future, um, put our brains together with others. And I think that would be really great. Definitely. Yeah. I and, like you're cool. You're, you're very cool. I like that. And I also like you won me over when you mentioned systems thinking because systems thinking is, is the way I see the world mm. as a complex adaptive system. So it's very important. Um, theoretical approach is where the practice based approach. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you very much, Rachel, for yeah. joining us. And we'll thank you for to seeing you soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Okay, I guess uh, this is it. Uh, even if the, we have one person, hello, Michael, who has just joined uh, at the end of the meeting. But it's good to see you, Michael. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have been here uh, three hours. The meeting is almost over, but uh, everything will be on YouTube tomorrow, perhaps. And uh, you'll be able to watch uh, all uh, the talks. Okay, I'm going to, to switch uh, the recording off now.